Uh, so I'd like, I'd like to welcome you guys to the open mic session for this uh, month of June. Uh, this being the last Saturday of the month. We usually hold these talks at the last Saturday of the month. Thank you so much for taking your time to log in and to join us in our discussion today in regards to poisoning. Uh, our presentation today is going to be done by Dr. Bahati Mosetti, who is a consultant emergency medicine physician and, and also certified in anesthesia, anesthetist. If I'm not wrong, Doc, I hope I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, if can. Yes, if can. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. So, uh, I'll, without a, without much ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bahati to begin the discussion today. Poisoning, and again, thank you guys for joining in. I hope this will be a lively discussion. I uh, will be able to ask your questions uh, once Doc has done is done with this presentation, and then we can call it a day. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Doc. Over to you. Let me just uh, stop sharing. Stop sharing my screen so that you can share yeah. yours. Okay. So, okay. Doc, you can share your screen. Okay, no worries. Um, okay. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> as Dr. Mbuvia said, uh, this is an open mic session and um, we we'll really encourage participation um, to make it more lively. Um, my name is Dr. Bahati Mosetti. I'm a fellow of the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine, uh, consultant uh, emergency physician and intensivist, uh, currently working at the Nairobi Hospital. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about poisoning today. I think um, many of us have seen poisoning, whether we're MOs, consultants, um, um, any, uh, wherever we work in the health uh, space in this country. And sometimes it's very difficult to, assess, to, to manage these poisoning uh, patients. And uh, sometimes we get our knickers in a twist by doing things that are not standard, all in the effort of trying to help the patient. So. I am going to talk about a systematic approach to a poisoned patient uh, and then I will uh, briefly talk about some common poisonings uh, that we see here and I, I chose three. Uh, if we have time we'll look at others so I chose to look at organophosphate and carbamate poisoning, uh, paracetamol poisoning and methanol poisoning. Uh, uh, we'll also have a footnote on uh, kerosene and uh, hydrocarbons because uh, these are the common things we see. Uh, so without much ado, I'm going to start. Um, so let me see. Okay. So I think we should have a system systematic approach to the poisoned patient. Um, just an introduction there. Acute poisoning is a common emergency medicine presentation. Um, it's a dynamic medical illness that frequently represents potential life threats and the exacerbation of a chronic psychological disorder. Patients can either deliberate self-poison or they can uh, do, uh, present from recreational drug abuse. Um, we can have occupational poisoning and venoming, snake bites and all that stuff. But as clinicians, I think we need a robust and simple clinical approach that can address uh, this heterogeneity of patients. And um, <clears throat> I think, uh, uh, I think uh, from emergency medicine principles, uh, which are really simple attention to ABCs and then specifics, uh, and that way we'll have a good outcome uh, with these patients. Um, all right, so I said, so we should always start at resuscitation. Uh, sorry, let me just see that. Yeah, so resuscitation. With all poisonings, we have to resuscitate these patients. And then we have to do a risk assessment. Um, and then uh, we, sorry, one minute. Uh, can you, see, you still see my slides? Uh, no, Doc, we can't. Um, uh, it's disappeared, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, there. They don't know what happened. Okay, yes, they are back. Okay, you can see them, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see them now. Yeah. All right, so resuscitation, I said risk assessment. There's a, a, a something in a mnemonic is RRSI 
dead. So resuscitation, resuscitate these patients, do a risk assessment, which I'll, I'll come to and talk about the risk assessment that we shall do. And then all these patients need supportive care and monitoring. We need to do some investigations. And actually most of these poisonings don't have very many investigations, specific investigations. Uh, and then we can uh, then we can do some gastrointestinal decontamination, of which I think most people see a poison patient. The first thing they do is to pump out the stomach or to do gastric lavage, which is obsolete. Shall talk about some gastrointestinal decontamination uh, things that we can do, and then we can talk about enhanced elimination of these poisons, and then antidotes, and then disposition, and that is where are we going to take these patients? Are we going to admit them to HDU, ICU, a normal ward? Uh, disposition. Um, so in resuscitation, we have to pay uh, um, to uh, to, of course, look at the airway, ABCs, as I said. Uh, so look at the airway. Make sure the airway is patent. These patients might have vomited. They have vomitors in their airway, and they their airway is at risk. So look at the airway and clear it. Look at the breathing, and breathing can be uh, uh, um, affected by many things. Patients can have a head injury. Uh, which is um, uh, which can uh, a head injury or the poison could, could have affected their brain and is affecting their breathing. Acidosis, they could be acidemic, and uh, their breathing is affected. Uh, the poison or uh, an inhaled poison can have uh, pneumonitis and affecting their um, uh, oxygen uh, exchange at the lung level. Look at the circulation, and then in the uh, and, and, and in the resuscitation, always detect and correct seizures. Some of these poisons, like organophosphate poisoning, can trigger seizures or lead to seizures. So remember in toxicology, toxicological seizures are always generalized. Uh, most of the time, let me not say always, most of the time are generalized when they are due to a toxicological cause. And we just need benzos for them. I think there is no role of uh, anticonvulsants, specific anticonvulsants in, 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 in toxicological seizures. Always look at a check and correct the blood sugar, hypoglycemia. Some of these poisons uh, can either directly or indirectly lead to hypoglycemia. So check a BSL in all patients with altered mental status. And actually in all patients who come in with a poisoning, just a, a, a simple needle stick uh, will uh, um, detect any hypoglycemia. Uh, make sure they are euthermic, uh, uh, correct hyper or hypothermia. Some poisons can lead to things like serotonin syndromes, which can shoot your temperature up and which can have detrimental effects. So I think any temperature more than 38.5 degree prompts urgent intervention. I think we can tolerate a temperature of 38.5. So uh, seek and treat hyper or hypothermia, hypothermia. The patients could have been poisoned and obtained and exposed, uh, especially like now Nairobi is really cold. They could be outside there in the cold and they come with hypothermia. And then in the resuscitation phase, uh, we should uh, um, um, uh, always administer an emergency antidote administration. And there are some antidotes that I'll talk about. Uh, CPR in, in, in poisoned patients should always be prolonged and continue until our expert advice can be obtained if it's there. And uh, in, in, in advanced centers, like now in the Adnan Nairobi Hospital, we started ECMO. And uh, ECMO, if available, it's only available, I think, there can uh, provide a life-saving uh, bridging, uh, uh, bridging procedure until, until we get rid of the poison, if we are able to. Uh, so, so we've done our resuscitation. I said resuscitation, uh, and then we go to our risk assessment. We have to risk assess these patients. And uh, the risk assessment will depend on the agent. What have they taken? Um, and I think always we should bear in mind that these patients, most of the time, will have taken, or in the, ma the majority of these patients will have taken uh, more than one agent. So maybe a patient is trying to kill themselves and suicidal and they take tablets. Most of the time they will have even taken uh, something else like alcohol. So always consider a co-ingestion uh, with the agent. And then always look at the dose because of course the dose is directly related to their, uh, uh, their outcome or their clinical progress. Look at the time since ingestion um, and uh, uh, of course uh, the half lives, absorptions of drugs and all that. So time since ingestion is really, really important. And then of course with each agent that they take, 
we should be aware or try and uh, find out what are the clinical features and the progress of that poison that they've taken or the overdose that they've taken. And then there's always the patient factors, uh, which is the patient weight and comorbidities. Uh, for example, a patient who is uh, prolonged fasting, uh, who is, uh, um, uh, has liver issues and uh, has taken Panadol, of course, that they will have a direct, um, a direct effect on the outcome of, their, of what they have taken if they've taken a Panadol overdose. So that, that also should be taken into consideration. Patient factors, that's weight and comorbidities. Um, so the other thing with the risk assessment, of course, we might never always uh, get it right. You know, sometimes we may get it right or we may not always get it right, but we have to try and, and predict what, what's going to be the outcome of, 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 of what, whatever they have taken and the clinical cause. Um, all these patients should be, if available, you have monitoring. So duration of the observation of these patients will depend on the agents, as I said, uh, the expected clinical cause and uh, potential complications according to individual risk assessment. Um, we have to determine what type of observation and monitoring is required and not all of, not all of us work in centers where we have a monitor that we can monitor the heart rate all the time, uh, we can monitor SATs and all that, but try and give them the best. So monitor the SATs, monitor the blood pressure, repeated blood pressure measurements, especially if uh, the clinical cause is, uh, we think that the, whatever they've taken might uh, uh, drop their uh, blood pressure. Um, they might compromise their, air, uh, their airway, um, they might get sedated and stop breathing and vomit and aspirate, so re regular, uh, regular monitoring. Endpoints, and then we have to be aware of endpoints that will trigger um, a notification of the treating doctor if they are in the ward or you will call a toxicologist, a consultant for further consultation. <clears throat> we have to have management, management plans for agitation or delirium. So some drugs, some, some syndromes might develop later like a, an anticholinergic syndrome or a cholinergic syndrome, a serotonin syndrome. We have to be aware how we are going to manage this. And most of these syndromes are easy to manage. It's just benzos, take care of the airway, breathing and circulation and, and just expectant management of these patients. We have to have a criteria for changing management. When do we step up the management? When do we stop the management? When do we discharge them? And remember, these patients have um, uh, these patients have have poisoned themselves uh, because of uh, psych issues, social issues. So, and some of these patients might want to abscond uh, from uh, in, uh, in from inpatient care. So we have to have a plan for them. Uh, should we should we let them go? Should we uh, keep them against their will and all, and all that stuff? So those are things to consider when we see these patients and uh, and, and 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 managing them. Uh, investigations uh, for these patients. Um, investigations, as I said, are, um, sorry, my phone rang. Investigations are, uh, they are baseline investigations which uh, will monitor these patients and their specific investigations. As a minimum, I consider like an ECG, for example, just to see if some of these uh, poisons might have uh, effects on the ECG rate rhythm, PR intervals, QRS intervals, QT intervals, and dominant R wave in, uh, in, in some poisonings that can um, uh, affect the, let's say, fast sodium channels or some uh, uh, conduction in the heart. So an ECG can tell you a lot. So if you have an ECG, just a quick ECG and have a look at it. Look at the QRS interval, it might be widened. PR interval might be widened, so they can cause bradys and blocks, especially antihypertensives. They can reduce the rate. And, and there's the, actually, there's a, a whole big lecture on uh, the ECG in toxicology, and there's a lot we can gain from that. But at the moment, just look at rate rhythm intervals, QRS intervals, QT intervals, and look for an R-wave in AVR, which can um, point us towards uh, uh, fast sodium channel blockade um, uh, poisoning. As I said earlier on, a bedside blood sugar is really important. And because I don't know if this is common here, but uh, some things that we can treat very easily, like uh, uh, we have antidotes for Panadol, and these patients could have taken Panadol very widely available. So 
I think this is to develop some guidelines if you're going to, in your, each of your institutions, if you're going to do a, a Panadol level for all poison patients. I know in some places it's, a, it's compulsory because it's easy to manage, easy to pick up and to treat that. Uh, so so that those are screening investigations and then there will be specific investigations uh, depending on the poison that the patient has taken. So gastrointestinal decontamination, uh, which is, uh, is big, we have induced emesis um, and that never happens. That, that has stopped if you're if you going to uh, 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 cause patients to vomit, um, that is no longer has a place in toxicology. So people used to be given Ipecac syrup to induce emesis, but look, nowadays there's a lot of, we, we know more, we can supportively manage this patient, so we don't induce emesis. Dangers of making patients vo uh, vomit include aspiration, aspiration pneumonia, big, big, big aspiration pneumonia. So uh, beware of that. Uh, there is gastric lavage um, that has been touted before, and I don't, I do not think there's a center that does that, that does gastric lavage anymore. Um, very, very rarely indicated, and I think this should not be done. Stop. We should not do gastric lavage. Um, another form of gastrointestinal uh, decontamination um, that is a uh, that is a uh, that we can do is activated charcoal, uh, which is safe. But there are dangers in activated charcoal, so patients can be, and there are indications and clear contraindications. For example, uh, alcohols. Um, there's some things you, can, you, you cannot give activated charcoal. For example, toxic alcohols, methanol, you cannot give activated charcoal. Uh, there are single dose activated charcoal and multi dose activated charcoal. Uh, so, single dose activated charcoal, of course, it's messy. You can have a pulmonary aspiration of activated charcoal. Um, and then if you put a nasogastric tube in, there have been cases of uh, <clears throat> direct administration into the lung via misplaced nasogastric tube, which is potentially fatal. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, there is impaired absorption of subsequently administered oral antidotes. So if we, we, have, we have an oral antidote for the poison and you've given the charcoal, that is going to block the, the, the antidote from being um, uh, absorbed. Uh, they've been uh, people have been distracted uh, <clears throat> from the resuscitation and supportive care priorities, all for the sake of giving activated charcoal and making sure that this patient has activated charcoal. So we will stop. We will even stop taking care of the airway. We'll even stop putting in lines, but we want this patient to have activated charcoal. So just beware. This uh, it can distract you. So there is a so. If a patient has, has taken hydrocarbons and alcohol, so ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, ethylene glycol, that is antifreeze, I don't know if it's available here, uh, and methanol, you cannot give activated charcoal. There are some uh, overdoses like an iron overdose, lithium overdose, potassium overdose, activated charcoal doesn't work. Corrosives like acids, alkalis, GIC, activated charcoal does not work. So you can't use activated charcoal. And then there is whole bowel irrigation as a, as a means of gastrointestinal decontamination. And uh, there are some potential useful um, uh, indications for this. And a whole bowel irrigation is a labor-intensive form of gastrointestinal decontamination that attempts to cleanse the entire bowel by administering large volumes of osmotically balanced uh, polyethylene glycol, that is PEG-ELS. Rarely performed because of the risk-benefit risk analysis reserved this intervention for only life-threatening injections of sustained release or enteric coated preparations. Very, very minimal and very, very, um, very, very minimal uh, uh, in indications. So, for example, an indication that you can do whole bowel irrigation, I've never seen it done, I've just read about it, um, is a, it's rarely done. So an ion overdose, for example, potentially more than 60 milligrams per kilo slow release potassium chloride injections, life threats of slow release verapamil or dutazem, uh, arsenic uh, trioxide injection, uh, lead injection or body packers. There are people who swallow some drugs or body staffers and, and they fly and uh, drugs of abuse. So whole bowel irrigation is potentially useful. But I think we should not do it uh, here. We should always uh, consult and always stick to safe uh, methods of, of managing uh, 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 
poison patients. Um, so uh, enhanced elimination, um, enhanced elimination just basically uh, increases the rate of removal of an agent from the body with the aim of reducing severity and duration of clinical intoxication. A form of enhanced elimination is multi-dose activated charcoal and those are the drugs that are indicated. So multi-dose activated charcoal, you give it multiple, multiple doses of a, a time. Uh, basically, so it's, it's a form of GI, GI dialysis, sort of. So the drugs indicated for multi-dose, multiple dose activated charcoal, carbamazepine, dapson, phenobab, quinine, and theophylline. That's very, very narrow indication, as you can see. Um, and then we have urinary alkalinization. I think most of you have heard of this, or uh, many of you have heard of this. So we can alkalinize the urine for phenobab and salicylate. This basically enhances elimination of these drugs. And then uh, enhanced elimination, which I'm sure many of us are aware of, is hemodialysis and hemofiltration. And uh, these are the drugs we can, so carbamazepine, lithium, metformin, um, people have lactic acidosis from metformin, Potassium, you know, as you know, with the potassium hyperkalemia, we dialyze these patients. Um, salicylate, aspirin, poisoning, theophylline, toxic alcohols, including methanol, isopropyl, uh, we can uh, hemodialyze these patients, and valproic acid uh, overdose, uh, we can hemodialyze them. And then there is a rare, rare form of enhanced elimination called charcoal hemoperfusion. Uh, of which uh, a drug indicated there is uh, theophylline. All right, let's come to antidotes. We have multiple antidotes. I've just put a list of a few of the antidotes. Atropine, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, uh, uh, we're going to talk about it later. Calcium channel, uh, calcium for calcium channel blockers or hydrofluoric acid skin exposure, which we don't see a lot. Uh, there's ferioxamine for acute iron overdose, uh, digoxin immune fab for immune uh, for digoxin overdose. I'm not sure if we have it here, um, and um, this is uh, for either acute or chronic digoxin overdose. Uh, Dimacap di di dimacaprol for lead or arsenic or mercury. Ethanol for toxic alcohols. We'll talk about it later. Flumazenil for benzodiazepine overdose. And uh, I think I'm just going to talk just very briefly about flumazenil. If you have a, a patient who's been uh, on benzos and been taking benzodiazepines, drugs to sleep and all that chronic benzodiazepine uh, user and he presents to your emergency department and is drowsy, I'll not give him flumazenil because this is just going to, uh, it's going to trigger seizures. So I think flumazenil is a limited indication for uh, benzos, especially if they have, maybe they're undergoing a procedure in the operating theater and you want to reverse their benzos, then you give it. Or if it's kids who are not, who are not uh, abusing benzos, of course, like maybe 10 year old has taken some benzos, then you can give flumazenil. But I think for the majority of the patients who come in drowsy and they've taken a benzo overdose and they've been on benzos, just good supportive care management will uh, will see them through and they, they 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 clear their benzos and then they go home so just pay attention to the airway and breathing and make sure they're fine you can even support their breathing just intubate them for a period of time and and the benzo goes and very rarely do we need to intubate these benzos benzo overdoses so Beware of flumazenil. Indications are very, very uh, limited on flumazenil use, and not anybody <clears throat> who comes to the department, to your department because of a benzo overdose, uh, needs flumazenil uh, because you might trigger seizures. Um, folinic acid is rescue therapy for methotrexate. Uh, for mepizol, for methanol and ethylene glycol, I don't think we have it here. I think it's found in the U.S. mainly. And a very, very common antidote is NAC, n acetylcysteine for paracetamol overdose. There are many, many other uh, antidotes, but just a few uh, to have a look at. <clears throat> and of course, um, in these patients, we have to uh, disposition. Where are they going to go? We just adequately observe them, depending on risk stratification. Um, would we admit them under? They need to come in under. I, I'm not sure if we have uh, toxicologists. Uh, uh, here, do they come in under physicians? Do they come in under, under emergency physicians, ICU? If they're going to ICU, of course, intubated, they go there. Then there's a, there's, there is a question for emergency observation units, which 
um, maybe it's a new thing here. We need to start and put these patients there because they need very close observation. I think a poisoned patient should not go to the ward where they're going to get orbs every four hours. Uh, they should be in a somewhere that um, more regular orbs, even if they're not very serious, more regular orbs and, and a decision made, as I said earlier. So that is a brief, brief approach to um, uh, the poisoned patient. I'm going to pause there a bit and, um, <clears throat> and ask and open the floor for questions and some discussions, since it's an open mic forum. Thank you so much, Doc, for that initial part of the presentation. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, maybe one thing I'll say about uh, your last point in regards to patients who are poisoned and uh, the need for, for them to be in a place where their vitals can be monitored more frequently rather than in the wards where it happens maybe four hourly, that is if it happens four hourly. Uh, I think mostly that one should be a system issue. Because if I can give an example of where we, or where I practice in KNH, usually uh, once the patient has been stabilized, uh, the next move is really to move them to the ward, the medical ward, uh, where they continue with their, with their treatment, which be done for there. So, and in those particular areas, I'm not entirely sure about how frequent their vitals are usually checked, given the number of patients who are there. And the reason why we cannot keep them in the A and D for observation is because that particular space that they are occupying is something is, is a space that is needed by another another patient at that time. So our point usually also with them is usually just to stabilize them, and once we know that they are stable, we can move them to the ward. And that's a good suggestion. Having a place where they are having them vitals monitored more frequently because they can quickly um, change and deteriorate before. And we won't have enough time to do the intervention. I think that that's a good point to cannot really look into. Uh, so I'm opening the floor to anyone with any uh, questions, comments uh, about to Dr. Bahati about his initial part of the presentation. Uh, you can just unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself to us, and then ask a question or give your comment as we continue. Like we said, it's an open mic forum, so you can ask anything, ask your ask your questions. We'll see how best to answer them. And yeah, so if you're ready, just unmute yourself, introduce yourself and give us your question and uh, your comments. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Paul. I'm just going to, uh, today we have a, a participant all the way from Perth, Western Australia, Dr. Ronald Isaboke. He's a, a senior registrar in emergency medicine. So he's nearly done with his training and he'll join us very soon. Karibu sana. Ah, ah nice, that is awesome. Karibu sana, Dr. Welcome Hi. to our uh, yeah. Welcome to our talks. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the emergency medicine training in Australia, and we look forward to having you back in Kenya, Okimaliza. We need we need more guys in emergency med, but uh -huh. so <laughs> karibu, right. karibu sana. So, so thanks a lot, Dr. Museti, and uh, is it Dr. Mbuvi or yes, yeah. Dr. Mbuvi. Think, yes. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk, Museti. I think it's quite uh, a, a very well organized approach the way you've brought it there. I think just to say there's a significant gap in sort of toxicology type of training because I think in Kenya, it's pretty much, you'd find that such patients are managed in the wards by the physicians who might not have sort of extensive experience in intensive monitoring and managing of these patients. While here we are a bit lucky because when they come to an emergency department, so they'll be seen by an emergency physician, we'll do a proper risk assessment, we'll work out a disposition. So there's a few of them who can go to a normal ward in the ED and get observed, like the observation wards that we have in emergency departments over in Kenya. So they can go there, stay for four hours, and if your risk assessment is low, then that's fine, you can discharge them. Uh, there's patients who will require to go to a higher dependency sort of unit and in that place they can either be monitored by an emergency physician or anyone who's trained in sort of toxicology and they require repeated observations and things like that so i think that is a big gap that i think it's not our problem but it's more of like a larger wider systemic issue that we need to look into sort of training of toxicologists or training of either emergency physicians or internal medicine physicians in toxicology so as to have a sort of a better place to keep and manage these patients. Other than that, uh, I think it's really good. I think this is a good step going forward and hopefully 
in future we can put our brains together and establish sort of a policy or a curriculum in which we can have pathways to train people. Thanks a lot. Karibu sana, Doc. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, 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 and I think we need emergency observation units or short stay units where uh, where these patients can be seen. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, and some of them, as Dr. Uh, Isaboke has said, can go to the wards, but most of these people will need intensive. Either if patient is not going to ICU or not going to HDU, then we are lost in between. Do they stay in the emergency department all that time? And and, and crowd the area and take up resources. So that's something that's something that we should look at. Uh, the floor is still open. Um, I want, I'm happy to field any questions depend on, on the uh, approach to a, a poisoned patient. So the floor is still open. As we said, this is an open mic session and uh, should encourage uh, people to, uh, to talk, come up and talk. And uh, that, that way the session is more interesting and we learn more. Knowledge is not only one way, it's, it's, it, uh, it's both ways. So I'm also happy to learn before I dive into organophosphorus agents. Uh, okay, uh, Doc, let, let me ask, because I know uh, in one of our tech trainings, we were training in Kisi um, County in the hospital and we were having the discussion in regards to uh, decontamination, gastrointestinal decontamination. And given that the practice of um, gastric lavage still quite rampant if i can say it's quite it's used a lot in um, other in other centers which are outside the the, con the confines of nairobi and uh, so for for them uh, for the people who still do gastric lavage what will be the consideration for them because it's something that is so uh, it's in, it's one of the things that they have been doing consistently and uh, what we noticed when we were doing the tech training was that uh, for most of them they are, they it, it actually it works for them so they see no need to stop doing it. And considering the fact that it's actually, um, they consider it to be a life-saving uh, thing for the patients who present to them. So if they can't do gastric lavage, what are the alternatives and why do we not continue doing gastric lavage? Maybe we can uh, dive into that a bit. Uh, <clears throat> what I can say about gastric lavage is that the amount of toxin removed by gastric lavage is very unreliable and negligible if performed under the first hour. It does, I don't think it confers any clinical benefits when performed routinely or on unselected patients presenting to the emergency department uh, following deliberate self-poisonings. And there are very few situations where the expected benefits of this procedure might be judged to exceed the risks. Because there are very many risks involved in this. Um, you can have pulmonary aspiration, hypoxia, laryngospasm, uh, mechanical injuries to the GI tract. Uh, in children, you can have water intoxication. Uh, and hy hyponatremia. Um, you can have hypothermia if you're using very cold fluids. And as I said, also in, ga uh, in gastric lavage, uh, there is destruction of staff from resuscitation and supportive care priorities. <clears throat> what I think if a patient is poisoned, if a patient, especially in deliberate self harm, <clears throat> for example, what, what are the potential poisonings here if you have antihypertensives? and uh, let's say panadol what else do we have here uh, organophosphates and all that supportive care and very good excellent supportive care and management can get good outcomes take care of the airway intubate these patients if they need to be intubated put them in a icu uh, take care of the breathing uh, and circulation make sure their blood pressure is good and and just do this good supportive care a b c d e make sure gcs is okay i mean sugar is fine uh and they're very i think for me i have i have never seen uh, gastrointestinal uh, lavage gastric lavage done i could like someone to tell me in which poisoning i want if any any of uh, the people here are attending i'd like to, to i'd like to know if you've done a successful one and which poisoning it was but I think if you absolutely, actually, like um, the other day uh, at Nairobi Hospital, there were some nursing students. And you know what? It is part of their training, gastro gastric lavage. So I, had to talk, I talked to them about gastric lavage. And uh, if you absolutely ha <clears throat> have nothing else to do, if uh, you, you have to do this procedure in a resuscitation bay, you cannot do this procedure in any patient with an impaired level of consciousness. 
unless you protect the airway with that you tube him tube the patient and you cuff the tube then you you position the patient in a left decubitus position with 20 degrees head down measure the length of the tube required to reach the stomach externally before beginning the procedure and then pass a large bore 36 to 40 gauge lubricated lavage tube ex externally gently down into the esophagus stop if any resuscitation occurs um, I think, I don't know, uh, the, for the people who have intubated patients here and tried to pass a, a, a nasogastric tube, you know how difficult it is to, actually I find passing a nasogastric tube more difficult than intubating. And then you confirm the tube in position by aspirating gastric contents. And remember, if you inadvertently intubate the patient with a, gastri with a tube, <coughs> with a gastric tube, uh, nasogastric tube, you are going to just, ask, um, uh, you are going to flood the lungs. And then, uh, of course, just confirm the tube or sculpted for uh, inflated air, the stomach. <clears throat> then administer 20 ml aliquot of warm tap water or normal saline into the stomach via a funnel and the lavage tube. And then drain the administered fluid into a dependent bucket held adjacent to the bed. And then repeat administration and drainage of fluid aliquots until the effluent is clear. Then after that, you give activated charcoal. Uh, you may give act activated charcoal. So. In contraindications, initial resuscitation is incomplete. Do not attempt that. Uh, and then if you do a risk assessment of the poison that they have taken, um, for example, a patient has taken Panadol or a kid has taken an overdose of Panadol, I will not do a gastric lavage. Why? Because Panadol, I will do a risk assessment and paracetamol has an excellent antidote. It doesn't matter even if they've taken tons of Panadol, they have an excellent ad antidote by the name of n cysteine so the risk of me doing a gastric lavage and is more than than uh, I, than the risk of giving n-acetylcysteine n-acetylcysteine they will have some they might have uh, allergic reactions and all that but it's a very very safe drug so if you do a risk assessment and the risk assessment says there's good outcome with supportive care and antidote therapy alone just don't do gastric lavage i have never seen any indication for gastric lavage so far and i've been practicing emergency medicine for the last uh, 16 to 18 years uh, and then of course if there's an unprotected airway where there's decreased level of consciousness uh, or the risk assessment indicates a potential for this complication during the procedure so someone has taken maybe propranolol we know propranolol has cns effects and they have not kicked in yet and then you want to do a gastric lavage these patients might aspirate later because their level of consciousness will drop in small children it's contraindicated absolutely gastric lavage if there is a if there is an if there is a potential for corrosive ingestion if they've taken jig for example you cannot do a gastric lavage if they have taken a hydrocarbon ingestion and a hydrocarbon here including kerosene kerosene is a hydrocarbon that is a complete contraindication of gastric lavage so just with all those contraindications i do not see uh, so far an indication for gastric lavage so uh, I, I'm going to defer this to Dr. Washira as well maybe he'll make a comment uh, but I think gastric lavage we should try to avoid it as much as we can okay Th thanks for that doc um, I don't know if Dr. Washira is on then maybe he can also give us a comment on the same uh, but to the rest of the participants, in case you have an, a question, anything about an issue in regards to poisoning and uh, management of poisoning, you can just unmute, raise your hand, or, or you can raise your hand so that I can see, and then we can hear your question. I can see we have one comment from the chat from Grace Mukundi, who says that every single patient with whatever drug overdose is, as, is admitted to the high dependency unit, regardless of the timelines. And I think that one, that's a good approach, but then also now looking at the systemic, if the systems that are there, um, admissions for all patients to HDU, given our resource, available resources in regards to HDU, that um, for most of the public hospitals, that becomes a big challenge. But yes, those are things that we can actually be looking forward to initiating. And I like what Dr. Ronald said about having short stay units within the emergency department that's that's also a very a very interesting aspect a very interesting thing to look into that you can probably have like a three or four bed um ward inside your emergency department that can just be used for short stay uh, for that initial part of just seeing that the patient is stable enough not to be able to go to the ward 
that's a very good um, point. Uh, there's one of the participants uh, who's here by the name of Dr. Temesi. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you, Doc. Ah, yes, Doc. Uh, I wanted you to give us uh, your comment in regards to gastric lavage and what we have been discussing today. Uh, Dr. Temesi is one of the doctors in Kakamega County, whom we had uh, an opportunity to interact with during our tech, our tech training in Kakamega County. Uh, Doc, Karibu, uh, tell us something. Tell us something about poisoning and your experience in regards to poisoning while working in Kakamega County. Hi, thank you. So I'm Dr. Temesi. I work at Malava County, sub-county hospital in Kakamega. And uh, until until uh, tech training that we had a week ago, we have been doing gastric lavage, doc, and uh, mostly for cases of organophosphorus poisoning. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I may not really comment much on the success of it, except that there are patients who've turned out okay, and those who did, and uh, those who didn't uh, turn out okay. But again, that was because of how. Uh, they were at a time of presentation. That those who came uh, having taken it too long, GCS low, and uh, given our setting, I mean our limited uh, resource setting, it was almost given that they're not going to make it because there wasn't much you could do. But nonetheless, we kept on trying a gastric lavage because it was pretty much all that we could do. But then uh, after the training, of course, that practice is uh, going to change. You haven't come across a, a patient after the training, but uh, that's what we're going to be to be doing as a new practice. But yeah, uh, to answer what Dr. Mosetti asked earlier on, yes, we've been doing it pretty much, you know, quite a lot. I guess that's all I can say about uh, about the issue of poisoning. It's it's, it's uh, the most kind of most common kind of poisoning that you come across these sites. OPP. Yeah, doc. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Temesi. Uh, Dr. Bati, so that's that's the experience that guys are having in uh, the fields. Maybe you can uh, comment on that. Yeah, look, <clears throat> what I can say is uh, I, dare, I dare say that uh, I don't think the gastro in the organophosphorus uh, uh, poisoning, I don't think the gastric lavage had any, um, maybe it took very little poison out, uh, but maybe these patients I think were going to turn out well despite what they did. So, um, look, I think it's something with this gastric lavage is something, it's, I think it's an outdated practice. I trained in Australia, I did most of my emergency medicine in Australia and we it's not never done and uh, don't even mention it uh, don't even suggest it uh, it's not done I think but you see uh, resources in different countries are different and uh, maybe uh, I mean this can uh, tell me uh, maybe that's what they had to do and they were trying to save the patient and that's what they knew to do and they did it and it maybe helped but I think with training as we roll out training all over the country I think we have to modernize our emergency medicine uh, approach uh, to poisoning. And as Dr. Ronald Isaboke said, we have a lack of toxicology uh, training in this country. I remember in my med school here at Nairobi University, the only thing I knew from toxicology is uh, desferioxamine. I don't know why it's stuck in my head. There was not a lot of uh, tox training. And I can see where the, there's, la there's positive of it. We don't have a formal post-grad for emergency medicine. so. I don't know why it can be taught in internal medicine probably and and then after that and they don't practice uh, emergency medicine so i think toxicology is uh, an arm of emergency medicine and i think now with more training and with uh, i think jk Uart is going to start an med in emergency med so and uh, dr washira is doing a lot of work at aga khan with the post uh, diploma I think with and, and 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 the tech training with the emergency medicine care foundation we are going to spread the message and we are going to change the practice of emergency medicine all right I, yeah go ahead paul yeah that, that, that's that's true doc um so I, i'm not seeing any other questions coming up so i think we, we can move on to the organophosphate organophosphorus agents presentation then maybe we, i think at that point you can get some more questions because most of the poisonings that we get even at KNH are usually organophosphate in nature so i think what you'll have to tell us would be something interesting and more, hopefully you can get more questions and comments in regards to that yeah thank you paul uh thanks thanks a lot for that let's go let's go ahead so Organophosphorus agents. So I think I will. Uh, the way I'm going to have a look at this is looking at organophosphates and carbamates, and also chemical nerve agents are are, are part of uh, organophosphorus agents. But we shall not dwell a lot on them. So 
Organophosphates are like clo chlorpyrifos, phenthion, malathion, parathion, triclophon, and uh, kumaphos. And all these are agents are available here and under different trade names, and they are used a lot in the agricultural sector. We are mainly an agricultural nation, so we have access to these. And people who are trying to die or trying to kill themselves will use a lot of organophosphates. As, as Paul said, it's a very common presentation. Uh, carbamates include aldicap, carba, carbendazim, carbazin, and uh, propoxa. These are the sum of the agents that I, I found uh, are very common in Kenya and chemical nerve agents, I think chemical warfare. I think Kenech had the simulation of chemical uh, something yesterday, which I, I didn't get time to attend. Uh, so risk assessment, remember, I want us to, uh, I want us to uh, approach patients in a very, very, so emergency resuscitation risk assessment you know, in the in the in the very very uh, clear um, and systematic approach, in that way we shall not miss anything. So, so of course, a patient comes in, you resuscitate them, attention to air when breathing, circulation, uh, and then you do a re an emergency antidote administration, which is atropine. You can give it immediately. Atropine is not an, it's an antidote, but does not take care of neuromuscular junction effects. We shall come to that. So. If we risk us in, an, in our risk assessment, uh, ingestion of organophosphate uh, almost always produces life threatening toxicity. So people can come, they have drunk it. Or some people, like uh, occupational, uh, uh, occupational, they have inhaled something. Uh, organophosphates are always uh, the, the base, they might have a, a solvent uh, which would produce uh, intoxication. Uh, and not necessarily, if, if they are inhaling it like farm workers, it's not the organophosphate, it's a solvent that is the base of, of this uh, chemical. Uh, so organophosphates, very, uh, very, uh, most, uh, almost always will produce a life-threatening toxicity. And carbamates, they will have a similar serious toxicity, but usually shorter duration. And carbamates are less likely to be life-threatening. Um, so inadvertent, or accidental occupation, uh, occupational dam or, or inhalation or exposure can cause toxicity, but is rarely life-threatening. And significant uh, secondary poisoning of stuff, that is nosocomial poisoning, does not occur. So a patient will come in um, and they have taken uh, organophosphates, they have poisoned, they have vomited and everything. I think significant secondary stuff is taking, of course, you wear your PPE and protective gear, and a mask and all that, but significant secondary poisoning of stuff will not occur. Uh, and uh, and in children, potentially lethal, any ingestion of organophosphates or carbamates is potentially lethal in children. So th that's that's uh, that's our risk assessment. Uh, in the toxic me me mechanism, uh, organophosphates inhibit acetylcholinesterase enzymes and increase acetylcholine, uh, acetylcholine concentration at both mascarinic and nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Uh, and so clinically thus, they will present with widespread effects of increased acetylcholine at the central nervous system or at the autonomic, that's parasympathetic and sympathetic and skeletal muscle neuromuscular synapses. So it's basically an overdose of acetylcholine. And there's something we call aging. I'm sure you've, uh, you've heard of this, aging. So aging basically refers, re refers to irreversible loss of any alkyl side chain and permanent binding of the organophosphate, which will prevent reactivation of acetylcholinesterase by the antidote pralidoxime. And the time, the time taken for aging to occur depends on the individual agents. Aging does not occur with carbamates at all. Uh, and organophosphates and carbamates are frequently formulated, as I said before, with hydrocarbon solvents like xylene. So inhalation of solvent fumes can produce headache, dizziness, but this does not indicate organophosphate poisoning. Uh, the insecticides themselves have very low vapor pressures and are only inhaled when you aerosolize them. So that is a toxic mechanism. Let's look a bit at toxi toxokinetics. Uh, so these agents are well absorbed after ingestion. Uh, Dermo and inhalational uh, 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 represent important routes following occupational exposure. And the agents generally have large volumes of distribution and accumulation in lipid stores. And uh, carbamates are distributed less to the central nervous system. 
and and there's something called thyroids uh, which are lipid soluble and act as indirect agents so they need activation uh, to, they need metabolism to their active forms and there are some of them that are thyroids uh, which if you look at the all all of this will come with a, a label so i mean if patients come in sometimes most of the patients here i know will present without without the label of what they've taken sometimes we have to like, really look which chemical is it but most of them will know the chemical and then we can and nowadays we are lucky we have uh, the internet in our pockets in our cell phones just google and see if it's a carbamate thyroid or uh, organophosphate so they the way they uh, they are metabolized is uh, primarily by hydrolysis in this uh, by serum hdl bound esterase enzymes that is paraxonases and others will undergo metabolic microsomal cytochrome p450 metabolism with the excretion of inactive metabolites in urine and most carbamates are metabolized in the liver by oxidation hydrolysis or conjugation and then excreted in urine just a note i don't think uh, i can't remember most of that uh clinical features of this uh timing of symptom uh onset depends on the agent dose and route of exposure so they could have drunk it they could have it could have been on the skin which is not significant they could have inhaled it which is the xylene solvent that they are uh, they are presented with and um, remember symptoms can occur within minutes uh, or following ingestion of some agents for in some minutes for example dimethoate chlorophos or they may be delayed by hours so it depends on what agent the variable symptoms they can be mascarinic or nicotinic as i said and the constellation and progression of symptoms is variable and either mascarinic or nicotinic features can predominate of course depending on what they have taken uh, that is a, a dimethoate uh, this is one of the chemicals available here and actually can be bought in a, any agricultural shop a decent agricultural shop in kenya uh, this one presents um early, it presents with early onset of coma cvs collapse and death within 24 hours if not treated and if they get intoxicated very little uh, 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 clo clopyrifos intoxication this is one of the agents that you can buy here uh, in any agricultural shop and these ones typically present with early cholinergic symptoms. And just a reminder there, I put a table there to remind you of some cholinergic symptoms. Uh, in the central nervous system, the patients will present with agitation. They might have central respiratory depression. They may come in coma or they may progress to coma. They may come confused. They can be lethargic and most importantly, they can have seizures, they can present with seizures. Uh, neuromuscular symptoms they will fasciculate because they have neuromuscular blockade um, and they might have muscle weakness they might have parasympathetic uh, mascarinic effects which are part of the early cholinergic syndrome with abdominal cramping they may be bradycardic they may have bronchoconstriction bronchorrhea diarrhea lacrimation meiosis salivation and dumbbells if you remember that mnemonic in med school called dumbbells for cholinergic symptoms and they have they might have nicotinic side effects so nicotinic receptors are blocked so they present with the hypertension they may be midriatic they may be sweaty or tachycardic with just a constellation of symptoms of clo uh, chlorpyrifos but most importantly they present like this and they say they've taken some uh, we think it's um, an organophosphate we don't have to really drill down is it a mascarinic effect is it a nicotinic effect just let's crack on and manage them the management is across the board of all this is near similar uh fention this is some, another these are fention an insecticide that you can buy here for agricultural use and uh fention presents with a few early symptoms and uh they can be a late onset of up to two days of paralysis paralysis can happen two days two days after so uh, acute intoxication syndromes uh, mascarinic effects i mentioned it a dumbbells mnemonic diarrhea urination bronchorrhea bronchospasm vomiting emesis lacrimation and salivation dumbbells and they can have nicotinic side effects they can be fasciculating 
uh, tremor, weakness, respiratory muscle paralysis, tachycardic and hypertension. But remember, tachycardia is frequently pre present due to hypoxia and hypotension. That's the most common cause of the tachycardia that they present with. So those are some of the acute intoxication syndromes they can present with when they are trying to die acutely. Um, they can have also in the CNS, they can be agitated. They can be in coma. They can seize in front of you. Uh, uh, they can have chemical pneumonitis, especially if um, uh, the hydrocarbon solvent that these chemicals are presented with is aspirated. So they can have chemical pneumonitis uh, as part of a respiratory uh, presentation. So those were acute syndromes that uh, these uh, organophosphate poison patients can present with. They may have uh, an intermediate syndrome uh, of this, which is a delayed onset of paralysis, two to four days. I said, remember Fention? Two to four days of apparent recovery from initial mascarinic symptoms. So they recover and maybe they're sent home. So two to four days later, they just come with onset of paralysis. Especially Fention, Diazinon, Malathion. Malathion is very commonly available here. The pathophysiology of this is not known, but there is a hypothesis uh, whether it's from prolonged motor end plate stimulation <clears throat> or delayed redistribution from lipid stores or inadequate initial pralidoxime dosing. And I think the last one is very, very uh, um, important here because I think as doctors here, we try, we are very careful, especially with drugs that we have not used. I, I, I've used pralidoxim, but I look, I mean, I don't even know the dose or, uh, off my head, and sometimes the dose can be presented there. And you're afraid of giving adequate dosing, and then you give a little, do uh, you, you, you give inadequate dose, and then they present with this syndrome. So remember to adequately dose them. And with their endpoints of these uh, uh, antidotes, which you can look up. Then again, these patients can present with delayed sequelae. Uh, delayed neurotoxicity, which are uh, organophosphate-induced delayed neuropathy, OPIDN, which is a rare, rare uh, syndrome, and uh, it can come up to five weeks post-acute exposure to particular agents, particularly fention, clopyrifos, and parathion. So I think if they come organophosphate poisoning and you can determine which one of these chemicals they have tried to kill themselves with, um, then uh, you, you, should, you have to organize for a follow-up to make sure uh, that they do not uh, present with that or I don't know what the treatment of this will be, then you might have to see a neurologist. And it's basically an ascending sensory motor polyneuropathy, um, which is query secondary to aging of axonal neuropathy target esterase um, uh, uh, enzyme. All right, and then these patients can also have a chronic organophosphate-induced neuropsychiatric disorder, so they'll just run mad after some time. Uh, it's long-term and may occur following acute intoxication, or I, they think it's chronic low-level exposure, so they are always chronically low-level exposed and they just have this uh, a neuropsychiatric disorder. So <clears throat> that is in our risk assessment, and that is the clinical syndromes and the clinical presentation that these patients might present with, but remember we are very, very, this is where we come in as emergency physicians. Acutely intoxicated syndrome, how we're going to manage it, airway, breathing, circulation, and emergency antidote administration. Okay, what investigations can we do for these patients? Uh, screening, 12 DCG, as I said. I think an ECG should be a basic screening test. Blood sugar level, which is a bedside finger stick that can uh, um, uh, give us uh, in, uh, information. And as I said, <clears throat> it depends on institutions. Are you going to have a, 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 a um, are you going to make a policy of doing a paracetamol screening for all patients? Because paracetamol is one of the important, these patients could have taken Panadol and organophosphates, but depends institution to institution. I know in Australia, all poison patients have that. 12 DCG, BSL and Panadol level. That is the standard, standard mix when they come in. Then we have a specific tests, investigations. I don't know if we can get this. Red cell and plasma bacterial pseudocholinesterase activities. I'm not sure if we can get uh, this. And uh, diagnosis and management of acute anticholinesterase poisoning is primarily clinical. You should remember that. 
but sometimes it can measure cholinesterase activity and can be useful in making a definitive diagnosis or to monitor therapy. And uh, access to these assays can be very difficult and samples must be, proce uh, must be processed promptly due to in ongoing in vitro reactions. So I'm not sure we can do that here anyway. Uh, so, and um, the results might come out very late. And as I said, it's a clinical indication and we manage them clinically. So how do we manage this uh, organophosphate poisoned patients? Remember ABC and uh, remember potential early life threats that require immediate intervention. If they come in coma, they are <clears throat> specific way we have to manage the coma, hypotension, seizures, as is benzo, carefully titrated benzodiazepines, <clears throat> respiratory failure, they may need to be intubated. So early ABCs. And do not delay resuscitation by external decontamination procedures. So that should not take your, all your um, concentration and all you're trying to externally decontaminate these patients and you forget your ABCs. So ABCs then decontaminate them later when they are, when they are stable. And then we, uh, you, if the patients have um, uh, meiosis, excessive, excessive sweating, poor air entry, they are wheezing, they are coughing, they are bradycardic or they are hypotensive, commence early as possible, escalating doses of atropine. I'm going to talk about that later. And see if they are agitated, carefully titrated doses of benzodiazepines, carefully titrated. So we might give them more and they lose their airway and might lead to intubation and protecting their airway. Just carefully titrate the doses because they, they are CNS effects of agitation that will be treated by benzos. Do not be afraid of giving benzodiazepines. And I, I'll say that again, do not be afraid of giving benzos for agitation. People are very, very, very afraid of giving benzos. They might lose their airway. Yes, but they're agitated and they might proceed to coma. So just carefully titrated uh, doses. And then, of course, institute general supportive care, as we said before uh, in the slide. Remember our supportive care and management of our poisoned patients. So how do we decontaminate them? Remember re resuscitation, uh, supportive care, manage decontamination, gastric, uh, uh, enhanced gastric. Um, uh, uh, remember the things I said as we approach the patient. So you remove the clothes and put them in a plastic bag, leave them there. People will be inhaling organophosphates, just bag them. Wash their skin with soap and water and activated charcoal, no benefit, not indicated. Gastric lavage, no benefit, not indicated. All right? Enhanced elimination, not clinically useful. Uh, remember the ways I talked about enhanced elim elimination, uh, alkalinization, urine alkalinization, uh, dialysis and all that, that is not indicated here. Uh, but most importantly, I'll say I should have put that there, gastric lavage, no benefit, not indicated. Antidotes, atropine. So you started in escalating doses of atropine. Uh, you give the, it, atropine controls significant clinical features of cholinergic excess. Meiosis, excessive sweating, poor air entry, that is bronchorrhea, leading to a wheeze, cough, bradycardia, bronchospasm, hypotension. You, you, use, uh, you use atropine. So the way to give atropine is 1.2 milligram start. And then you double the dose every five minutes until there is resolution of bradycardia or there is drying of secretion and good air entry. Large doses of atropine may be required and continuing administration as repeat bolus doses or infusions is frequently required with atropine. So do not be afraid of giving atropine. In children, uh, atropine is given as a dose of 50 mics per kilo in children. And all, remember with doses of these medications, you can always consult online, you can call a friend, you can call a specialist, always consult. Remember that atropine has no effect on the neuromuscular junction and has no, in, no effect at all uh, on muscle weakness. So if they have nicotinic uh, presentation, the atropine is not going to change that. What are our therapeutic endpoints of atropine? As I said, the main one is drying of respiratory secretions. That's your therapeutic endpoint. 
I've just put a note there that uh, these patients may develop anticholinergic features uh, that will indicate excessive dosing. I just put a slide there to remind us of anticholinergic syndrome. So anticholinergic syndrome is manifest by central sim uh, signs and symptoms or peripherals. So centrally, it's an agitated delirium, which is uh, characterized by fluctuating mental status, confusion, restlessness, fidgeting, visual hallucinations. They'll be picking at objects in the air, mumbling or slurred speech, and they may have a disruptive behavior. They can also, uh, that's the agitated delirium. They may also have a tremor, myoclonus, coma, and rarely seizures centrally. Peripherally, they will have midriasis, they'll be tachycardic, they'll have a dry mouth, dry skin, flushing, hypothermia, sparse or absent bowel sounds, and they can have a urinary retention. I think there was a mnemonic for that. I can't remember it, but those are the peripheral symptoms of uh, the anticholinergic syndrome. So that's how you'll know that you've given too much atropine. But remember our therapeutic endpoint, drying of respiratory secretions. So another antidote, second antidote which they'll need, these patients will need is pralidoxime, which may reverse neuromuscular blockade by reactivating inhibited acetylcholinesterase before aging. Remember aging is when they lose their alkyl side chain and, and they uh, irreversibly bind. So, but there's been uh, some um, controversy about the clinical utility of pralidoxime, but we still use it uh, and it is indicated. Uh, and the dose of pralidoxime is 2 grams IV start, then continue an infusion of 0 0.5 grams per hour for at least 24 hours. And if you are sure they have taken a carbamate, uh, there's no, it's not necessary in carbamate intoxication. But how will we know? How do we uh, dispose of these patients? We may, they, most of them, if they have undergone all those, um, we've been giving them all those good juices of atropine and pralidoxime, we'll, end up, we'll admit them to HDU or ICU. Here, I see them frequently ICU. Do not discharge patients at night. Actually, this with all intoxicated patients or poisoning patients and snake bites, do not discharge at night. Continue observation for at least 24 hours of cessation of oxime therapy, that's pralidoxime. And remember, as I said, those delayed sequelae, arrange follow-up to detect intermediate and delayed syndromes. And uh, remember that adult patients with potential occupational exposure do not require referral to a hospital unless they develop significant symptoms. That's occupational, they've been working with them and maybe they are spraying, then maybe not wearing a mask, and then they, oh shit, I've inhaled some organophosphate, I need to go to hospital. They don't have symptoms, really, they need to go. But I think inadvertently all of them will end up there. But if they don't have symptoms, they do not need hospital referral. Okay, I'm just going to pause there on organophosphate and invite a few questions, if there are any. Okay, uh, thanks for that presentation, uh, Doc. So I know for most of us, we have encountered organophosphate poisoning in our various areas of work. So anyone who has a comment um, in regards to how we manage, or just basically even the presentation of uh, these patients and how we manage them, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, give us, uh, introduce yourself to us, and then you can let us, you can tell us your question or your comment. And uh, we can, so that you can move on that one. Because I know organophosphate poisoning is very, very, very common. So I'm expecting guys to at least give some input or ask some few questions. So the floor is open. Uh, you can just unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself. Let us know what your comment, and comment or question is. Hello. Yes, hello. Yeah, this is Dixon. Yes. I'm a clinician. So I had a question concerning the use of atropine and uh, pradoxin. Do we use both at the same time or we give one at a time? Thank you. Remember, remember um, both have different mecha mechanisms of action. So atropine, you are going to use it for uh, um, uh, the cholinergic, uh, cholinergic uh, 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 symptoms of uh, meiosis, except you're sweating and all that, okay. that's going to drive the secretions. And pralidoxine is going to help us in the neuromuscular junction. Okay. 
So Thank both you. will be required, depending okay. on how you're going to, uh, to uh, sorry, I'm just going back. Um, so pralidoxime is, so it's going to reverse the neuromuscular blockade, uh, neuromuscular junction blockade. Remember, atropine cannot do this. Okay. So it's different indications, uh, I mean, uh, different mechanisms of action. You will require both if the patients are significantly poisoned with uh, organophosphates. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Anyone else with a comment um, question? You can just go ahead. Uh, Paul, I think this is a very, very common poisoning here, and I think I just uh, I could also ask people to share their experience with this uh, with organophosphate poisoning. Very yes, yeah, yeah. That you can just share your um, your experience. I know there are nurses who have joined here, clinicians, medical officers, CEOs. Please don't feel shy. Just tell us anything, and remember, this is a learning. Uh, uh, experience for everyone. I have a question, Dr. Bahati. Yes, go ahead. For love gases like uh, sarin. Sorry? For love, uh, organophosphate, love gases like uh, sarin. Yeah. Do you still use polydoxin for management? Yes, I've never encountered that, and I've never seen anybody poisoned for that, but they are classified under organophosphate poisoning, and I've not really looked deep into their mechanisms of actions and poisoning, but I think we still use atropine for them and pralidoxime. I think if they're going to affect the neuromuscular junction, uh, we should use pralidoxime to reverse that, but I'm going to check on that. I've never really seen a sarin um, nerve gas poisoning. Uh, if anybody has seen that or has experience, I'm happy for them to share. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Nora. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm Nora, a medical officer. I just, I've just come in late when you're finished organophosphate. I just wanted to ask is, because I read somewhere, they were saying uh, gastric lavage is contraindicated. So I, I just wanted to know why is it contraindicated? All right, I think uh, we talked about, before you came in, we talked about, um, and I think the recording of this will be available, we talked about uh, approach to a poisoned patient and uh, means of uh, gastrointestinal decontamination, of which gastric lavage is one of them, and we said gastric lavage is contraindicated because of the inherent risks. There are many risks, and the first thing, of course, m many patients will produce, uh, will present one hour post poisoning and after one hour the the level the amount of toxin you're going to get out of the uh, stomach is very minimal secondly we said that a gastrointestinal uh, a gastric lavage has many risks uh, some of them are aspiration um, uh, water poisoning in children um, and uh, and just the the it's really messy it can it can uh, dis distract us from um, uh, from the from resuscitation and there are many many contraindications and actually it's not the risk benefit ratio of gastric lavage is not great and uh, if we have a way of like in a, in a organophosphate poisoning we have specific antidotes and specific ways of managing it then we don't go for gastric lavage let's just go with the science that we know we are going to give them atrop we are going to uh, do a resuscitation, we are going to give them supportive care and management, take care of their air breathing circulation, and then take care of their cholinergic syndrome, take care of uh, the neuromuscular blockade, and just manage them until they get better. So gastric lavage, I think what the teaching now, gastric lavage, it's, there's no indication. I don't think there's any indication for, any, for gastric lavage in any poisoning. Very, very few, which, which, which I will not advise anyone to do gastric lavage. Thank you. I've never seen it done. <laughs> live, live. Uh, Eric, are you asking a question or Eric Atwega? <laughs> All 
All right. Uh, any more comments? Um, yes. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Mosetti, for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> maybe the other thing to consider, because most of these patients um, that we see with the um, organophosphate poisoning, as you've said, is a um, suicide attempt in many of them. And um, uh, we often, I mean, we deal with the we deal with the physical aspects for those who um, go on to survive the poisoning and those probably who did not take large amounts. And then we discharge them home without addressing um, the mental health aspects. And many of them re-attempt and then you have the same kind of like an endless cycle. So I think um, in consideration for discharge of these patients, we need to also have them have the psychosocial evaluation and have um, some sort of uh, treatment for that so that we don't keep seeing the same patients over and over with the same issues, maybe trying different different um, agents um, for commission of suicides. I think that's one issue. And then on the gastric lavage, I think, as you've said, it's something that's still quite commonly done in in many emergency departments in Kenya. And most of the time, I think um, either I, most of these patients really present quite late, especially to the, to the public facilities. They present quite late and it will really be of no benefit because most of the poison at that point has, has been absorbed from the, from the abdomen. So yeah, thanks for watching. Thank you very much, True and uh, True Mo True Mochache. That's right. I'll just put up the slide on this position there. Um, all patients who've tried to kill themselves and uh, wanting to die should have a psychiatric evaluation. And sometimes most of these suicide attempts are a cry for help. Um, so they should have a psych evaluation before they go home. Uh, as I said, there maybe I did not elaborate further on that, but. Yeah, you are right. They should have a, a psych evaluation. Just a, another comment on gastric lavage. I think maybe, I don't know, I could be wrong. And maybe we are doing um, gastric lavage for lack of information, for lack of anything more to do, or we try to think we are going to help these patients. No, that's, the gastric lavage should be banned. We should not do gastric lavage. Don't do it. Actually, I think people will be very happy that told not to do it because it's very, very messy. I don't know if anybody has done it. It's really a messy procedure. All right. Any further questions, comments? Thank you, Mochache. Uh, yes, Doc. So I'm seeing there are yes, two yes. questions on the chat. OK, sorry. Um, they, I think there's someone who wants to say something. You can go ahead. Go ahead, please. Par. Uh, uh, that is me. My name is Benedict Par. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Doc, for the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm trying to imagine a situation. I'm, I'm an EMT here. I'm trying to imagine a situation where you have a gardener uh, who was reported to work drunk. Does the uh, alcohol combined with uh, an organophosphate change the change the care the care procedure the way you go about it? Okay. Um, remember, if he's he's drunk alcohol and he's had. Yes. Potential occupational exposure do not require referral yes. to hospital unless they develop significant symptoms. So you're a paramedic, you've been called that, and they've they've, they've come they've come to work. They are cut. They are drunk, and um, yes, they have not drunk the organophosphate. I think you can manage them according to intoxication. Remember as well that uh, uh, these organophosphates have solvents. Xylene. Remember I said about xylene. So they could be inhaling xylene as well. So it just gives them more more intoxication. At the end of the at the end of the day, uh, if you are one worried about the patient, if they have do they have significant symptoms, they have to go to hospital for assessment. So when they come to hospital, uh, alcohol we know how to manage alcohol. I'm going to talk about toxic alcohols, but alcohol really supportive care. So you'll come and assess them, look for uh, as uh, the uh, 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 anti they look for anticholinergic syndrome. I mean, a cholinergic syndrome, look for any, did they have any mascarinic or nicotinic effects? And then if it's a dermal exposure, inhalational exposure, most of the time with organophosphates, it will not lead to that. So they come and you, you, you're not, they, they're not specifically organophosphate poison, then just 
observe them for the alcohol until they get better and discharge them. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, remember, look at the last point there. Adult patients with potential occupational exposure do not need referral to hospital unless they develop significant symptoms. So their symptomatology could just be alcohol and and and, uh, and xylene related. And you'll manage it as such. Okay. Yeah. Unless they, of course, if they drink it, they've come to work and they mistake it for alcohol and they drink it, then of course, they'll be very sick. Then what would happen? As, as an EMT, then they shall come. Is to... <laughs> yours is to do ABCs as an EMT. They drunk the space ABC. Yes. Make sure the airway is fine. Do you guys intubate paramedics? If they if they no. are very very <laughs> just put them on the side and rush yes. them to hospital where we shall follow the resuscitation according to ABC, and then specifically address they've drunk it. Then we shall manage them according to organophosphate poisoning. Alcohol does not have an antidote and alcohol intoxication, normal alcohol, ethanol, is just observing observations and protecting the airway so that they do not vomit and aspirate. So if they drink the organophosphate, just bring them to hospital and then we shall manage them from there. Thank you. So airway, breathing, circulation, and get them help as soon as you can. Okay, uh, I can see there's a hand raised. Uh, Dr. Temesi, you can go ahead and uh, give us your comment. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a question about I'm Dr. Temesi uh, from Malava. I mentioned that earlier on. Uh, I'd like to ask a question regarding how to use atropine. In the ANE, you said the end point is uh, um, you're out of bradycardia and your, your, your chest has cleared up. You're getting uh, good uh, saturations. And you also mentioned that we continue with atropine infusion in the ward. So my, my question is, uh, what exactly will your end point be? What will you be looking out for? Because Earlier on, at least you had, say, secretions and bradycardia to guide you on how much to give and where to stop. But now in the world, you are giving an infusion. At what point do you stop? What do you look out for? And uh, for how long, really? Thank you. Yeah, uh, look. Uh, <coughs> so secretion uh, endpoints, 1.2 milligrams start, double the dose every five minutes until there is resolution of bradycardia, drying of secretions and good air entry. Right. I'm giving them atropine in the ward or HDU, I will still look for drying of respiratory secretions. And I'd be looking out for development of anticholinergic features that will tell me I've ex I'm excessively dosing these patients. Okay. Yeah, So I, that's, and that's what I'll be looking for, the slide of anticholinergic syndrome. I'll be looking out for those symptoms. Uh, and most of the time, by the time those symptoms are developing, you'll have dried all your respiratory secretions, and I'll stop. I'll stop it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Um, excuse me. Yes, Mochache. Just wondering, because a lot of the times here, the endpoint that people are looking for is pupil dilation. I'm just wondering your comments. On yeah, that. you can look for you can look for that as well. But for me, I think drying of respiratory secretions is a more pupillary dilatation will happen earlier. And they still have secretions. So I think drying of secretions is the end point that I'll be looking for. Okay. Uh, okay. So, Doc, there were two questions on the chat um, area. One question was um, for agitation, do you think barbiturates are okay? And, uh, uh, the, mm -hmm. yeah, and the second question was what's the time, the time window for pralidoxin, for pralidoxin to be used? Um, so, uh, pralidoxin, I think, I'll, I'll answer the second question. Pralidoxin should be used before aging occurs. And I think it's within 24 hours, but I'll check that it's within 24 hours before the aging starts. I think six, six to 12 hours, I think, I'm not sure, I'll check on that. But pralidoxin must be used before aging occurs. Before if aging occurs, pralidoxin has no effect. Uh, for agitation, I will not, what did this say, barbiturates, I'll not use barbiturates. In toxicology, barbiturates have other side effects, they bind to other receptors. The safest thing to use for agitation is benzodiazepines, clean, tidy, go for some receptors and easily, easy to manage. By the time you use barbiturates, you are having other side effects. So I think the, the best thing for agitation and the indication for agitation is benzodiazepines. And the good benzodiazepine I'll use is midazolam. If you don't have midazolam, you can use diazepam. But first choice, midaz, midaz, or diazepam. No barbiturates for agitation. Okay, uh, thank you for those answers, Doc. 
Anyone yeah. else uh, with a question or so that you can proceed to the next part of the presentation? Yeah, like we said, today it's all about poisons, all about poisons and more poisons and how to manage them. And uh, we, we are looking at the common things that occur in our emergency departments or the things that uh, patients are usually quite, they have access to, as easy access to. So um, given that I'm not seeing any other hands raised or questions, I think, uh, Dr. Bati, we can continue not to paracetamol poisoning. Right, uh, let's go on. Um, so paracetamol overdose, very common overdose, very common and confusing in management um, because it, you could have an acute overdose, you can have repeated supratherapeutic ingestion, and even now we have paracetamol uh, extended release tablets. Um, and and all all uh, the the the, um, um, the out the, the way to manage this is very different. Acute actually risk stratification is different from acute overdose and repeated supratherapeutic ingestion or extended release. So Panadol, common over-the-counter medication, um, fast drug. Many people who try adolescents try to kill themselves with. Uh, they will try with the Panadol. It is found. It is found in mixed formulations, um, uh, and NSAIDs and Panadol, dexamethasone and Panadol. So it's really um, something that we should know how to manage. Uh, easy to manage. It has a very good antidote. And will prevent uh, renal, I mean, uh, hepatic failure, fulminant hepatic failure. Uh, so let's look at one case a 16 year old female uh, with background of depression and has adolescent issues, like most 16 year olds will. And she's brought into your emergency department with a history of ingestion of 20 tablets of Panadol. She has taken some alcohol with it and she's try she has had some pathetic attempt of killing herself by just scratching her wrist, some small cut wrists. And she comes to you one, one and a half hours post ingestion, no vomits, but she feels a bit nauseated and she's drowsy. So from our participants, how can we, how do we approach this? Can I get some? Uh... And just before she has access to other medications, she's taken some quetapine. No, she has access to quetapine then the vaccine, but she denies that congestion. And apart from a tacky of 110 per minute, other vitals are within normal limits. And when you examine her, you find that she has minor lacerations to her wrist bilaterally. And uh, other physical examination is not actually done or no abnormality detected. I don't know what NAD means. <laughs> so how do we manage this patient? Let me just get some, because uh, Panadol is very, very common. M many of us have seen Panadol either acute, serious, or minor, um, minor uh, ingestions. Can I get someone to tell me how they're going to approach this case? So anyone uh, ready to answer Dr. Mosetti's question, you can just, you know, the usual unmute yourself and then uh, just let us know your response. If you want to send them home, you can say so. <laughs> hey, Mose, <laughs> sorry, answer. sorry. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if am I allowed to answer. People should. Yes, yes, yes. Should. Go ahead. Yeah. So, with any of this, so I'll just keep it simple. So, number one, uh, my priorities are number one to make sure I'm adequately resuscitating this patient. It appears that the patient is away. A, a bit drowsy, but has a patent airway and potentially is talking to me. So I'm happy with my A and airway that the patient is talking. Next, I'll make sure B, so I'll do a set of vital signs. I'll check his her oxygen saturations. I'll check her respiratory rate. I'll listen to her lungs and make sure that she's adequately breathing and there's nothing for me to intervene on B. And then on C, part of my vital signs, of course, I'll have a blood pressure. If the patient is hypotensive, I'll put an IV line and give a fluid bolus. And as I put an IV line, I'll take some bloods and send off for a paracetamol level uh, and potentially maybe a liver function as well. So with that, I'll make sure that the patient is adequately resuscitated. And I'll move on to my risk assessment. Uh, 
so with my risk assessment number one, I just want to know the dose. So it appears he's taken 20 tablets, you said? Yeah, 20 tablets of 500 milligrams per tablet. Okay, so I asked myself, so what is the dose? So 20, 20 or 500, that's 20 times 500, that's about 10 grams of paracetamol, mm -hmm. which is potentially a toxic dose. Uh, so I'll bear that in mind. And then the next part of my risk assessment, I'll ask myself, how long ago did they take it from the time they've presented to me? So I don't know if you put it there on the slides, how long ago? Yeah, so she, we don't know. She said maybe an hour or two. She was not sure. Uh, All right. Got so, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. So I'll say, yep, potentially within the last few hours, but it's pretty much an unknown time of ingestion. So so that will be my risk assessment. Uh, the, I will also be worried as part of my risk assessment that potentially there could be other co-ingestions with it that the patient may not be telling me. So because the patient, patient has got high up in at home and venlafaxin. So I'll also be aware that there's a potential possibility that she could also be intoxicated with this. Uh, yep, and that will be part of my risk assessment. I'll ask her if she's got any allergies. I'll ask her if she has any other medical comorbidities that I should be worried about. Is she asthmatic? Is she diabetic? Is she immunosuppressed? And all that. So I'll finish my risk assessment at that. R, R. Then the next one, I'll just start my supportive care. So if the patient's a bit drowsy, is a bit dehydrated, I'm giving fluids. And if they're not breathing as well, I'll give them some oxygen just to support their oxygenation. So the next, it will be investigations. As a minimum, I'll do a blood sugar. I will do an ECG. And with the ECG, I'll be looking for any signs of uh, other intoxications like sodium channel blockade. So I'll be looking at the PR interval, the QRS, make sure that the uh, make sure that there's no dominant R wave in AVR because such you can find in quetiapine and venlafaxin. So if I find abnormalities in the ECG, then I'll be suspecting that the patient also might be having venlafaxin or quetiapine intoxication. Okay, so, and then I'll send a group, a, a set of blood tests, including a paracetamol level. However, uh, I will try and make sure that the paracetamol level is done at the four hour mark. Uh, from the time of ingestion, because uh, that will give you an accurate idea of what's going on, because it might take time to rise. So that those are my investigations. And then next would be treatment. So uh, now this is when I will be discussing with, with either a toxicologist or consulting a friend on whether we should start an acetylcysteine as, a, as an antidote for this. Uh, but given that dose uh, that we've start that of 10 grams, uh, potentially I'll start NAC because anything over 10 grams has a high risk of uh, uh, causing liver impairment. So I'll just start my NAC and then depend, uh, and follow the protocol for NAC infusion. Uh, I think there are many other aspects of management, but I just decided to go with that approach as an example, Masetti. You can clarify, correct, or add on to that. Thanks. Ex excellent, excellent. Uh, very, very, very good summary. Um, and a uh, very, very good summary. And I'm just going to touch on some aspects of timing of Panadol tests uh, and uh, interpretation of uh, Panadol test results. So thank you very much, Ron. I think that is just really in concise uh, fashion the way we're going to approach this case. Case number two, uh, you are in your emergency department and you have a 45 year old office worker who had uh, post uh, back surgery about 10 days uh, ago. So ten, day 10 post back surgery, presenting with increasing back pain and nausea. And uh, this patient was discharged home on tramadol and panadol. And this patient has been on about 10 tablets of panadol per day, tells you that. The abnormal, the vital signs are vitally normal the, the patient is vitally normal and you're just doing part of your workup because he has nausea and you you note that this patient has abnormal LFTs on workup. We have to, these are some of the cases that we miss repeated supratherapeutic injection of Panadol, which is potentially hepatotoxic on this patient. So people who present with chronic pain and they're coming to you, you should always make it a habit of asking of the Panadol, how much Panadol they are taking, because they could just be popping Panadol and, and they are messing up their liver. So I'm going to, uh, uh, this is another case I'll talk about. So 
I'm going to look at Panadol uh, and two prongs. Number one, there's acute overdose of which uh, Dr. Isaboke has told us uh, concisely how to manage, which was on point. And then I'll look at another a bit of confusing uh, repeated supra-therapeutic ingestion of Panadol. Because these patients can have repeated Panadol, sub, you know, just sub-therapeutic ingestion. Someone taking 10, maybe taking 10 tablets a day, that is 5 grams every day. That is a lot and they can injure their, their liver. So risk assessment, uh, life-threatening hepatotoxicity is, is, is uncommon. This is an acute, uh, acute overdose. So life-threatening hepatotoxicity is uncommon, and the fatalities are rare. Uh, threshold dose for Panadol-induced hepatotoxicity is extremely variable, and we can put it as 10 grams, as Dr. Isaboke told us, or more than 200 milligrams per kilo. So when you're doing your risk assessment, get the weight of the patient as well, and that's try and make is it more than 200 milligrams per kilo, or more than 10 grams. Children can tolerate higher, higher doses of Panadol than adults. Remember that. So the threshold for children for paracetamol induced hepatotoxicity is a bit higher than, than adults. Uh, the risk of hepatic injury in acute overdose without N acetyl cysteine is, predicting by, is predicted by plotting a serum paracetamol level taken 4 to 15 hours later on the Prescott or Remark Matthew nomogram. And I just put the nomogram there so that we can look. Remember when you're using the nomogram, so what happens? The patient comes in. This is based on a four-hour Panadol level. So, as you can see from this nomogram here, between zero to four, if you, if you take a Panadol level at two hours post-ingestion, you can plot it there, you cannot interpret it. So, if you maybe take a, a, a six hours when they come in and uh, you, you do the pa blood Panadol level and it is uh, 400, uh, 400 micromoles per liter, it's below the curve, so if you plot anything below the curve here, the patients do not need NAC. That means the liver is just going to handle that Panadol uh, toxicity. If you plot the Panadol level and is above, uh, above the curve, then they, they need n acetylcysteine. This, most of these nomograms are confusing. As you can see here, it's mil milligrams per liter and it's micromoles per liter because of the unit different labs uh, measure the Panadol level with. So make sure if your lab is not measuring in milligrams per liter or micromoles per liter, convert it. Nowadays, it's very easy to go to MD Calc, convert it and trace it uh, and, and plot it up here. This nomogram can be found anywhere online, just and then plot it and see if the patient needs NAC or not. This nomogram is based on a four hour level of Panadol, between four hours to about 16 hours. After that, it's not applicable. The nomogram is not applicable. And this is only an acute overdose. So probability of hepatotoxicity, and that is peak AST or ALT greater than 1,000 international units per liter is. So if, if, um, if, if, uh, if, if the serum paracetamol level is less than 1,320 micromoles per liter, uh, 1 to 2% risk of hepatotoxicity. And as you can see, those are different levels, 90% uh, probability of hepatotoxicity if your four-hour level is greater than that. And those are just some researches that have been done. Um, so when you use NAC, n acetylcysteine, I think there's someone who's unmuted. Uh, could you kindly mute? So when you're using NAC, um, and uh, by the way, the risk of hepatic injury with n acetylcysteine is determined primarily by the time from overdose to commencement of NAC. So survival is 100% when NAC is commenced within eight hours of ingestion. So the patient comes and tells you, I took Panadol overdose at uh, um, maybe um, two hours ago. And the acute Panadol overdose just took maybe 10 tablets, five tablets, took them. And you're not yet within four hours. You can wait because you can start that knock within eight hours. If you really believe the patient is saying the truth and whatever, and you, you determine on your risk assessment that it was two hours ago, just take a four hour Panadol level so that you can interpret it with a nomogram. So if you start NAC between 8 and 24 hours, the benefit is reduced and the benefit is not established if the NAC is commenced more than 24 hours following an ingestion. And then risk assessment is problematic if the time of ingestion is unknown or staggered. So you don't know what time they took this tablet. So the risk assessment will be problematic 
and there are some time anchoring strategies we'll, we'll do or risk assessment will do uh, when we look at repeated supratherapeutic ingestion. You can biochemically risk assess them, not historically. So biochemical risk assessment uh, if the time of ingestion is unknown or is staggered. So a uh, toxic mechanism of Panadol, uh, it, has, it elevates the production of NAPQI following the overdose. Uh, and then it leads to depletion of hepatic glutathione stores and once the glutathione levels reach a critical threshold of 30% of normal, NAPQI starts binding to other proteins, causing hepatocyte injury. And if uh, at postmortem the, or you do a liver biopsy, the hallmark of paracetamol-induced hepatic injury is centri centrilobular necrosis. That's a hallmark. Hopefully you never get there. You'll treat them before they get there. Clinical features uh, and our risk assessment, we have to look out for clinical features um as i've listed there so um, stage one zero to 24 hours they could be asymptomatic they have only gi upset stage two uh, the nausea resolution or they may be nauseated and vomiting they might present with right upper quadrant pain and tenderness and then they can have a transaminitis uh, bilirubin or uh, 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 the uh, pt is increased and 48 to 96 hours, they may present with hepatic failure, jaundice, coagulopathy, encephalopathy. And then stage four, they will die from hepatic failure. Or if they are fighters, they'll normalize the LFTs and they complete the resolution of hepatic architecture by three months. So those are the stages in our risk assessment, clinical features that we'll be looking for. Most patients will be coming here at 0 to 24 hours or somewhere here if they are late. Um, so that's, those are clinical features. I just wanted to make a mention of phase two, where a, they have a transaminitis, and it, it peaks at around 48 to 72 hours and can reach 15 to 20,000 international units per liter. And remember, hepatotoxicity is when there are more than 1,000 uh, international units, so they are, they are destroying their livers then. And pro, prothrombin and INR are at their most abnormal within hours of peak AST and ALT. So if you do your coags, uh, uh, that time, that's where the, the INR will be at their peak before it starts going down. They might be hyperbilirubinemic and they may have uh, impaired renal function. So toxokinetics, just a small mention of that. I think I'm just well absorbed. Peak levels at that one to two hours for standard tablet or capsule preparations. And remember Panadol also in, in, within 30 minutes. Uh, someone's mic is on, please mute. So within 30 minutes of liquid preparations, um, uh, they'll peak, the level will peak. Uh, a volume of distribution of 0 0.9, I never remember such uh, um, um, details. And 90% uh, of Panadol is metabolized by hepatic glucorinidation or sulfation, and the conjugates excreted in urine. Um, NAPQI goes into... <laughs> Julian Jaroge, kindly mute your mic, please. And you have uh, macaptopuric adducts in urine. Uh, so, investigations, uh, a serum panadol level at four hours or as soon thereafter as possible. Remember, we are aiming to start n acetylcysteine within eight hours. So we try and get a serum panadol at four hours. And um, we can do an ALT and AST, peak at 48 to 72 hours. Some times may not be necessary. Movie, could you kindly mute Julian Jaroge? Um, INR or coag coagulation profile can be done, especially for late presenters, to see uh, if they are uh, coagulopathic, if they are already uh, messed up their liver. And um, if you do a gas on these patients and they have an acidemic, uh, they have a metabolic acidosis, that's a poor prognostic indicator. So an investigations guide, some of, some of us, some of you might be working in areas where you don't have a lot of uh, labs, you can't do some elaborate labs, and sometimes you can just do minimal tests, for example, if you can do a sedum panadol, or patients, even, even if we have the facilities and patients don't have the money to run some of these tests, even acute ingestion, and they present less than eight hours, you may be able to get away with just doing a Panadol level and giving them NAC. 
And then, so if they have come less, less than eight hours and you are sure from your history is just an acute overdose, you might not need to do transaminases, you might not have to do INRs and all that. Do a NAC, do a sit and level, give them a 20 hour, uh, plot it on the rumac Matthew nomogram and just give them an infusion of 20 hours of NAC and they go home and home they go. Excellent outcome. Uh, 8 to 24 hours. At presentation, you can do as transaminases and the others are not between 8 to 24 hours. You may get away without doing them. But if they come at more than 24 hours, you may have to do all the tests because now we want to assess them and stratify them if they have really, they have hepatic damage already. So, I mean, I think with Panadol tests, there are bedside tests which will do, I mean, uh, uh, screening tests and some specific tests as I've indicated. But most often what we do is they come and we we'll do all this because sometimes they'll be lying to us. Sometimes we don't trust what they have said. They might be having other comorbidities, other things. So we do, they could be diabetic. They have uh, diabetic uh, um, renal uh, issues. So we do all the tests. So this is just a guide to minimal testing in Panadol overdose. So uh, remember with all poisoning, supportive care and monitoring, resuscitation, ABC, do your general supportive care, correct hypoglycemia, that's 16 year old, we need a pregnancy test as well, she was nauseated, it could just be uh, she's having morning sickness, uh, correct the hypoglycemia, repeat the test as indicated, uh, patients with rising aminotransference levels and INR more than 2.5 should have a four hourly recording of vital signs and bedside uh, serum glucose and close monitoring of fluid balance. Decontamination. Uh, so do we give these patients activated charcoal? You can offer activated charcoal as a way of decontamination uh, to a cooperative adult within the first hour. And this may reduce the four hour Panadol level to such a degree that n cysteine may not be required. Activated charcoal is also controversial. Are you going to give it to a child who has had an acute ingestion and then they vomit and get charcoal pneumonitis? I find that in my practice, I never offer children activated charcoal, especially um, uh, uh, ingestion of Panadol, because if I chat, the four hour level of activated charcoal is nasty. I mean, are you going to give it? A child will not drink the 50 grams required. Uh, they will vomit. It's, it's, it's really a nasty, nasty testing drug. Are you going to give it via nasogastric? So I think it's fraught with a lot of uh, danger. And I, I find it's never justified following an acute ingestion. I know there's some people who give activated charcoal, but just something as simple as Panadol level, I will not give. I will do a four hour level and then I will give them NAC if they need. And remember, children can tolerate higher levels of Panadol than adults. Enhanced elimination, the things I talked about, not clinically useful. So we'll skip that. Antidote, n your cysteine, talked about it. Uh, less than eight hours following defined time of ingestion, very good result. Eight to 24 hours, uh, commence immediately. And so someone presents eight to 24 hours after acute ingestion, and they tell you the history, they've taken a lot of Panadol, start an, an, an N-acetyl cysteine immediately, and then you can stop it once you have a Panadol level is obtained at a, uh, at four, uh, uh, at, uh, sorry, that's, that's a wrong statement I made there. So you just start immediately, and when the Panadol level is, is low, then you can stop it. If you have an unknown time of ingestion, and you detect paracetamol, you start, and, and they've taken Panadol, uh, you start with NAC, and then you seize it when transaminases are normal, or at the end of a 20-hour infusion. And if they come more than 24 hours, uh, you give NAC if paracetamol is detected on the on the paracetamol, you do a paracetamol level, or if you then if you don't detect the Panadol, you um, you uh, continue you you start NAC if the transaminases are elevated, and you continue until transaminases are falling and the patient is improving clinically, and you may commence NAC pending biochemical assessment in patients with nausea, vomiting, abdo pain, or encephalopathy, because that can uh, herald some Panadol toxicity. So just a mechanism of action of uh, n cysteine, it prevents NAPQI-induced hepatotoxicity when given within eight hours of acute overdose. 
It ameliorates the clinical cause of toxicity when given after that time or following repeated suprotherapeutic injection, of which I'm going to talk about. And the possible mechanisms of action are uh, increased glutathione availability, direct binding to NAPQI, or it may provide an inorganic sulfate for sulfation of uh, uh, excessive excess panadol, and it may reduce reduction of NAPQI back to panadol, the reverse uh, cycle. And when you're giving uh, n cysteine, monitor for anaphylactoid reaction during and after the initial dose. And if a patient gets an anaphylactoid reaction, it's rare that they get full-blown anaphylaxis. When they get an anaphylactoid reaction, you just decrease the loading, the speed of loading, because NAC is given in three, so you load it, then you give uh, an infusion of four hours and then an infusion of 16 hours. So if the anaphylactoid reaction can be mild, itchiness, nausea and all that, they rarely get anaphylaxis. So if you see an anaphylactoid, maybe loaded now over one hour, because normally the uh, loading, loading of NAC is over 30 minutes. So you can load it over one hour, over two hours, just decrease the speed of loading, the loading dose. Uh, <clears throat> that's our NAC dosing, 150 milligrams per kilos. Uh, you can get that online. You can put it in dextrose or saline. Uh, so that is the initial loading. And then the four hour bag or 50 milligrams per kilo in 500 mils. And then 1,000 milligrams per kilo in 5% uh, dextrose. In children, same dose, but infused in smaller volumes. And in children, replace fluids with 0 0.5, 0 0.45 sodium chloride if there are concerns about hyponatremia. All right, there's a, that's a small um, guideline about NAC and what I've talked about. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly. And um, in acute overdose, it's unco in uncommon cases, a rising INR and a hepatic transaminase is herald fulminant hepatic failure and the need for liver transplant service. If you have such, I think here in Kenya, it's only KNH and Nairobi Hospital Naga Khan. And, and very 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 rarely in other places where there is that they are put on a list for hepatic for transplant because uh, they can have fulminant uh, liver failure need a, a new liver so and uh and those are the criteria for uh considering uh re liver replacement uh, re liver transplant if they have an inr more than three at 48 hours or more than 4.5 at any time heralds fulminant hepatic failure and they'll need uh a liver service, uh, oliguria or the creatinine of more than 200 micromoles per liter of the acidotic with a pH of less than 7.3 after resuscitation, that would be a red flag, or the systolic hypotension with the blood pressure less than 80 uh, persistently, uh, or if they're persistently hypoglycemic or they're severely thrombocytopenic, or if they have an encephalopathy of any degree, any hepatic encephalopathy, then they will need a, a liver service. Uh, pitfalls in acute panadol overdose. Uh, if you fail to commence NAC immediately in a patient who presents more than eight hours of panadol overdose, they might pre they might uh, progress to hepatic failure. They are very frequent uh, n acetylcysteine dosing errors. And I think the dosing error in n acetylcysteine is people think that this is a lot. If you calculate this 150 milligrams per kilo, my God, you come up with the uh, uh, grams and people say, uh, people say that uh, you you have uh, given too much too much of uh, NAC. So with the 150 milligrams, 50 milligrams, just once you calculate per weight, just give it. The dosing errors in NAC are underdosing, not overdosing. Uh, and then of course there's failure to check the Panadol units on the normogram. And most per liter, milligrams per liter, deci, whatever, micromoles per deciliter. Make sure you check that. Some uh, controversies, the choice of a nomogram, the risk factors, uh, whether alcoholic, uh, do these patients have they been uh, prolonged fasting, they are more at risk. And uh, patients with um, use of uh, particular medications like isoniazid, rifampicin, and, uh, and uh, do we increase the rates of NAC infusions for massive overdoses? Because we tend to give we to keep them st just standard infusions. So, but people could have massive overdoses. So, the jury is still out on that. So, for interest of time, I'm just going to because I still have uh, toxic alcohols. 
I'm just going to go to repeated supra-therapeutic injection of Panadol and how to address, approach that. Uh, <clears throat> and this is when we get the definition of this is uh, a staggered dosing with therapeutic intent. Most of these people who have repeated RSI, repeated supra-therapeutic injection, most of these are, do not want to kill themselves. As I said, like the scenario I gave an office worker with back pain and just trying to get an algesic effect and they inadvertently overdose themselves. So if they're taking more than four grams per day in adults, then you have to uh, uh, biochemically risk uh, assess them for an, an overdose. And in children, more than 60 milligrams per kilo uh, in children. So in adults, as I said, is a self-medication for acute pain or in exacerbations of chronic pain. And in children, initially, it's a therapeutic error. And um, you know, the Panadol uh, um, liquid comes in maybe five milligrams per meal and, and people make calculations uh, an error. And maybe they have been giving a kid more, maybe double the dose or triple the dose, maybe for three or four days. So it's usually an error from the parent. And remember, in repeated supratherapeutic injection, um, standard nomograms do not apply. The rumac matthew nomogram does not apply. So you cannot take a Panadol level and chart it and say it's below or above, and that will uh, inform your decision to give n cysteine. And, and uh, the decision to treat is based on estimation of dose in conjunction with a biochemical risk assessment. So you are testing uh, serum Panadol, level and hepatic tr aminotransferase levels and that will uh, in inform your decision to treat these patients so uh, biochemical risk assessment for adults uh, uh, they if they have a history of 10 grams or more than 200 milligrams whichever is less over a single 24 hour period then the, the, then you do a biochemical risk assessment or if they have been taking six grams or 150 milligrams per kg over 24 hours, whichever is less, for the preceding 48 hours or longer, and or if you think they have increased susceptibility to Panadol poisoning, alcoholics, patients on isoniazid, or patients who've, been, who've had prolonged fasting, uh, their threshold is lower, it's four grams or 100 milligrams per kilo over the preceding 24 hours. Um, Remember, our biochemical risk assessment is based on an untimed Panadol level and a hepatic transaminase level, ALT or AST, at presentation. That's what we are going to look for. So if they have an ALT or AST of less than 50 international units per liter and a Panadol level of less than 20, 120 micromoles per liter or less than 20 milligrams per liter, good prognosis, no further investigations required or treatment required, regardless of reported dose discharge them. Uh, if they have an ALT or AST of greater than 50 international units per liter or Panadol level of greater than 66 micromoles per liter or that's greater than 10 grams, these are higher risk group and you start NAC, you pending further evaluation. So you would be uh, evaluating them. Why do they have that transaminitis? Do they have some um, um, hepatitis or is it really the Panadol they took? So further evaluation. Okay. Uh, in children, uh, risk assessment is a bit, um, uh, so patients less, less than six years of age are referred for a biochemical risk assessment if there's a history of ingestion of that Panadol 200 milligrams per kilo or 150 over the preceding 48 hours or more than 100 milligrams per kg over 24 hours for the preceding 72 hours. You can all check this online, all these are available online. Um, Antidote, same, immediate n cysteine if clinical features of hepatitis, that are trans if they have a transaminitis of clinically hepatitis and history of repeated supratherapeutic ingestion. Otherwise, commence following biochemical risk assessment. And you give intravenous n cysteine for at least eight hours. Then you measure your serum ALT or AST. And uh, if there's a rapid rise in hepatic transaminase levels consistent with evolving paracetamol hepatic injury, and NAC is con then you continue the NAC at 100 milligrams per kilo or over 16 hours until patient is clinically well and ALT and INR are falling. And if a patient has a falling or static serum transaminase levels, uh, the values, they suggest a resolving injury or alternative diagnosis and NAC may be seized. 
So that's just a flowchart of uh, N-acetylcysteine uh, in repeated supra-therapeutic injections. So handy tips or pitfalls, just inquire about analgesic use in all patients presented with acute or chronic pain. Minor elevations of ALT or AST up to 300 international units per liter are common and usually related to coexistent alcoholic or viral hepatitis. In absence of known previous values, NAC is started until it is demonstrated that hepatic aminotransferase levels are not rising rapidly. And another a pitfall is failure to identify cases of repeated supratherapeutic injection of Panadol. So patients come, they have pan paracetamol induced liver injury, but we don't pick it up because of, uh, we have a low suspicion. No published prospective studies of RSI and risk assessment in children. And, and the risk assessment in children is controversial, but we still do it. We have nothing else to do. Okay, so before I go to methanol poisoning, I'm just going to open the floor for questions. I know I've, I've, I've gone really quick uh, over Panadol, but I think it's something common that we face, and I'm just going to open the floor for any questions. I know there's modified release formulations and all that, but with acute, acute intoxication and a repeated supratherapeutic injection, I think... Uh, those two we can manage uh, the modified release formulations. Lucy Muhoho, question? So anyone with any questions for Dr. Mosetti in regards to paracetamol poisoning? Um, I know we have guys on the group who have probably encountered one or two cases of paracetamol poisoning. Uh, so you can just uh, unmute yourself and let's hear what you have to say. It could be a comment, statement, a question in regards to this, so that we can move to the next, uh, the last, I, th I believe the last part of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. so anyone just uh, unmute, let's hear what you have to say. So then I guess we are all very comfortable with Panadol. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised uh, or any questions, but I think maybe probably at the end of the session, we still have, uh, we'll still have a few minutes to go through any questions that anyone may have in regards to the entire presentation. So, Doc, I think maybe we can we can move to methanol. All right, let's go to methanol. Uh, very common methyl alcohol, common presentation. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just going to uh, just take a drink here. Okay, so methyl alcohol, uh, methanol. Um, I think it's very common, and I think uh, we've read in the press about uh, poisoning people suddenly, lights being turned off in a in a changa den uh, people not recognizing that it is a uh, methanol poisoning sad, uh, cases of blindness and it's really rampant worldwide not only here so um and as usual i will i keep on going back to our template resuscitation risk assessment uh supportive care management investigations decontaminations antidote disposition, RRSI, DEAD, RRSI, DEAD, always go back to that template for all poisoning. So in our risk assessment, uh, ingestion of more than 0 0.5 mils per kilo of 100% methanol is potentially lethal. Um, ingestion of less than a mouthful is benign and does not require hospital evaluation and less symptoms develop. Co-ingestion with ethanol, that's normal booze, complicates risk assessment. And in children, a taste or a leak is really minor, but uh, the, the threshold for children is 0 0.25 mils per kilo. Uh, that's half of 100% methanol. But remember, in, in just in a 10 kg toddler, that can equate to just 2.5 mils. Very little dose in a toddler that can lead to toxicity. So beware of that, that's our risk assessment. Uh, uh, methanol really, uh, the toxic mechanism, uh, production and accumulation of formic acid, 
uh, produces a severe anion gap metabolic acidosis, causes direct cellular toxicity uh, due to inhibition of cytochrome oxidase, and there's retinal injuries normally uh, from uh, retinal injury in edema can cause blindness uh, because of uh, the uh, injury to uh, the retina. And <clears throat> in brain, a pathonomic uh, uh, feature is, <coughs> excuse me, subcortical white matter hemorrhages. And uh, in the putamine edema, that's classic. If you do a CT head, uh, that's what you will see. And there's late hyperlactatemia occurs due to inhibition of cellular oxidative metabolism. Um, toxokinetics, rapid absorp absorption peaks in 30 to 60 minute, minutes, rapid distribution across the total body water, volume of distribution is 0.7 liters per kilo, and then it's metabolized by liver uh, ADH, um, <clears throat> alcohol dehydrogenase to form aldehyde, and then aldehyde dehydrogenase to formic acid. That's the metabolic pathway. Uh, elimination half-life is 24 hours. So, uh, uh, methanol, uh, there are many uh, phases, clinical features, and uh, it's time-dependent. Uh, in, in the first one hour, the features will be similar to ethanol, similar to alcohol, the, the alcohol that we drink, the booze. So there will be mild CNS depression. Uh, patients can be a bit nauseated. They may vomit. They may have abdominal pain, and there's a latent uh, uh, period, 12 to 24 hours, where they'll have a headache, dizziness, they might have vertigo, they can be dyspneic, they might complain of blood, vision, and they might be photophobic. Um, then they can have a stage of severe intoxication after that, where they'll be tachypnic, drowsy, and this is a time when they go blind. Uh, and sometimes it can be very, very rapid. Actually, the state of blindness can be even after four, six hours. This is not, this clinical phase is the time, the time, um, the time uh, mark, markers are not really uh, rigid. Um, then they can progress to be obtunded. They may present with coma. They may have seizure. And the seizures really herald the onset of cerebral edema. And uh, papilloedema is a characteristic of progressive demyelination. And uh, if 30% uh, of patients who have papilloedema or who have visual symptoms will uh, suffer irreversible visual complications. That's a significant amount of patients. Um, there could be a clinical sequelae uh, of this, which patients might be blind. And these patients, especially those that recover from serious CNS toxicity, may develop extra pyramidal movement disorders, Parkinson's like movement disorders that is irreversible, the ones that recover from CNS toxicity. Um, so, how do we uh, investigate these patients? Um, as usual, screening test, 12 lead ECG, look for other things, uh, blood sugar level, because they could be hypoglycemic. And if you think is required, a Panadol level, most of the time not required here I, in our population. They'll be drinking in Changa dens and all that. Uh, and most of this is not, is not uh, suicidal. I think it's recreational. So specific, uh, specific tests, you'll do a urea electrolytes and creatinine. Uh, you're looking for renal failure. And uh, you can do a blood gas or a venous blood gas. There's always there's a question of, of, am I going to do a venous blood gas or am I going to do an arterial blood gas? I recommend just do a venous blood gas. Not all patients require venous uh, arterial blood gases. They don't have, unless they have oxygenation issues or breathing issues. So these patients uh, may have an iron gap metabolic acidosis. Um, and you can see they might have hyperlactatemia and elevated or smaller gap. There are ways of calculating that. And if they have that, that's a surrogate marker of intoxication of toxic alcohol, methanol. Um, you can do a breath of serum ethanol to check congestion. Remember, these guys will be drinking Chang'a then, so they might be accompanying their drinking with some vodka uh, or some beer. So, and if you, have the, if you have the facilities, you can do a serum methanol level, but the serum methanol level is not readily available in many places, and it's not clinically useful. 
the, the results are never available in a clinically useful time frame. And you can do a, 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 a CT scan because remember I said I might have some putamen edema and some um, uh, the, and subcortical white matter hemorrhages. So a CT scan of the head will be uh, valuable, an invaluable tool in uh, investigating these people if you have the facility to, to do that. So how are we going to manage them? Remember ABC. And in the air when breathing, these patients might have a lot of acidemia. If they are acidemic and they can present acidemia can cause a degree of respiratory compromise. And if you are going to intubate these patients, if they have lost the GCS is low and you intubate them and do not hyperventilate them when you've intubated them, uh, you'll worsen their acidemia and they may decompensate and die. So, if you intubate, hyperventilate. Um, and then, uh, because of the acidemia, consider bolus of bicarbonate, one to two millimoles per kilo. Just, I think most of the bicarbonate here comes in 100 millimoles. Just give them a start, 100 millimoles. <clears throat> and that will cover that. And this, uh, because systemic acidosis enhances formic acid inhibition of CYP450. And if the pH is less than 7.3, administer bicarbonate in 50 milli millimoles aliquots to raise the pH above this level. That's if you, if you have the facilities to do a venous blood gas or an arterial blood gas, but just do a venous blood gas. And treat the seizures with IV benzodiazepines. Remember in toxicology, the routine um, anticonvulsants have no role. If, it's, if they're seizing because of toxicology, uh, give them no Kepra, no other IV um, um, uh, anti-seizure agents. Use benzodiazepine titrate. De detect and correct hypoglycemia and general supportive care. Monitor fluid balance and urine output. And you can consider cofactor therapy, folic acid, 50 milligrams IV every six hours until the poisoning is definitely resolved, treated. Uh, gastrointestinal decontamination is not indicated, no lavage, no use at all. Do not do it. Uh, enhanced elimination. There's a role very significant. This is actually the definitive management of methanol intoxication. If you can dialyze these patients, uh, dialyze them and remove the methanol. It removes methanol and formic acid and corrects acidosis. And indications for hemodialysis in these patients is uh, uh, any patient that fulfills criteria for ADH blockade, as we've seen before, if they are acidemic with pH of less than 7.3, if they present with uh, visual symptoms, and uh, if they have renal failure, if they deteriorate uh, uh, deterioration of vital signs or electrolyte status despite supportive care or if you do a methanol level you can get it uh, greater than 16 millimoles or 50 milligrams per deciliter if available so if you can do that if you have that then you can refer them for dialysis uh, enhanced elimination as uh, that's a dialysis so indications for hemodialysis uh, as I saw oh, these are repeat slides sorry uh, and uh, as a temporizing measure while waiting hemodialysis or sometimes in some centers it is as a treatment you can use ethanol that is vodka whatever ethanol you can get it's a temporizing measure while awaiting hemodialysis if you can get hemodialysis or sometimes it's used as a definitive treatment in centers where you have no hemodialysis and ethanol competitively blocks the formation of toxic metabolites in toxic alcohol ingestions by having a higher affinity for the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase ADH. So what does we give them uh, ethanol? So if you have the ethanol, the, medic, uh, the, the pharmaceutical preparation of ethanol, loading dose oral, of, if they can take orally, of 1.8 mils per kilo, or for 3% ethanol, or 3 times 40 mils short of vodka in the 70 kg adults. If you've intubated these patients, or if they lost their airway, you've intubated them, you can give that through a nasogastric tube. And then you maintain them at 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 mils per kilo per hour for 3% ethanol, if you have that, or 40 mils short each hour. It's a, way, a good way of keeping them high. They're getting good, good, good alcohol while in your facility. 
And if you have the IV form of uh, ethanol, you load them with 8 mils per kilo or 10% ethanol, and you maintain an infusion at a rate of 1 to, 1 to 2 mils per kilo per hour of 10% ethanol. So most centers will have the oral form of vodka, so just give them the shots of vodka and then maintain, maintain them so that they keep on uh, competitively inhibiting the methanol. Um, Children who remain clinically well after suspected unintentional ingestion and have a normal venous bicarb of uh, 20 ml equivalent per liter or at 8 or more hours post-ingestion may be discharged. Adult patients who remain clinically well following accidental ingestion have normal venous bicarbonate after 8 hours or after serum breath alcohol ethanol levels demonstrated to be undetectable are fit for medical discharge. All symptomatic patients and those with, those with deliberate ingestion are assumed to have potentially lethal methanol intoxication and are admitted to hospital for further evaluation and management. Which sources of methanol can we get apart from our, in our Chang'a dens? We can get methanol from carburetor cleaning fluid, uh, chemical application in industry and science, solvent thinners have methanol, varnishes, paints and enamels. Um, aeroplane or car fuel, they can have some methanol, fuel additives, dyes and stains, racing car fuel, homemade or adult distilled spirit, that's where the most common uh, form of methanol or source of methanol in our setup, and from wood alcohol and wood, wood spirits. Okay, any questions? I'm really tired from talking now, I'll invite questions. Mochache, go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm just wondering, um, in a setting where the paracetamol level is not available, what alternative can be used in deciding on whether or not to give the NAC? Because I think uh, maybe in many of the peripheral facilities it may not be available, but um, I think colleagues can confirm. Sorry, sorry, Susan. I mean, uh, Mochache, what did you say? True, Mochache, what did you I Just repeat your question. So, uh, I'm saying uh, in a setting where the paracetamol level may not be readily available or some places it takes days to come, what mm -hmm. alternatives can be used in making the decision to give the uh, NAC? Uh, yeah, I think uh, in, in such setups, especially if you don't have labs, I will start clinically. Uh, what the histo his Historically first, what have they taken? How much Panadol have they taken? Um, calculate the, based on their risk assessment and just start NAC. If you have NAC, start it and then maybe you can transfer them to a place where they can do the test. If they have signs of hepatic failure or they are vomiting, you remember those those uh, um, the uh, clinical presentation, write up a quadrant vomiting, and they've taken Panadol. Just start them on NAC, and maybe you can refer them to a place where they can have their Panadol level taken and biochemical risk assessment. So if you have NAC, it's better to start NAC than not to start. Just start NAC. George Dulo, I, I don't know. Uh, true is that or is that that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, maybe also I missed it. Uh, are there any side effects of NAC that people should be watching out for? Anything? Yes, yes, they are. And I, I said they are um, um, they are anaphylactoid reactions, never truly anaphylaxis. Uh, nausea, vomiting, um, and, 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 and some people might have a mild rash. Uh, of course, we, we are worried about uh, anaphylaxis but uh, as i said you just and uh, most most side effects are anaphylactoid not anaphylaxis so nausea vomiting some uh rash uh some patients might have mild facial swelling or or or, or uh, itchiness so uh, the anaphylactoid reactions and if you get them de decrease the rate of decrease the rate of infusion of uh, loading dose and most of this happen when you are initiating NAC. Uh, someone else raised his uh, their hand up. Yes. Um, hello. Yes. Me. Uh, you are breaking. 
sorry, that was me. I was asking, I was asking if, uh, thank you for, thank you for the presentation. I was asking if the, the symptoms are the same through many ages because of the type of, um, of the agents that are involved in methanol poisoning. I was just curious to know whether the presentation is the same across ages because some of those agents you can find them say at home and say if a child sees an adult taking a certain substance and they mistakenly then end up taking that and they take an overdose of it how would you manage them with the with the signs and the presentations be the same across the ages either a child who maybe is two years who can access something like that, um, a teenager or or an adult, with the with the management be the same, with the will the presentations then be the same? Uh, because I think I saw as if you are giving us something that is sort of generalized for I would assume maybe someone who is an adult, a seventy kg uh, adult or something like that. So that is my question. Thank you. So I, uh, with the <clears throat> clinical features of uh, methanol, methanol poisoning, so it depends on, 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 of course, the age. So for example, a kid, you will not know, it's very hard to determine with if they have mild CNS depression or if they have significant CNS depression or mild, in, in a mild CNS depression in a child will be very different from an adult. So an adult will, will maybe able, still be able to talk and with the clinical features of methanol it is dependent on dose. Remember, risk assessment is milligrams per kilo, what you've taken. So you will have CNS symptoms. Child yes. adult teen have CNS symptoms. Tachypnea, drowsiness, blindness. Child adult teenager, you'll have the same symptoms. You can have papilloidema in child adult. Mm -hmm. What is different is the dosage. In the risk assessment the is the dose. Yeah, the dose. Uh -huh. It will determine the it will determine the clinical features okay remember okay. people will be different some people might not have uh, i mean you've seen people going to changa dens and drinking and some become blind and others don't have visual pathways mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. it's a range mm -hmm. of it's a range of presentation what i gave was a mm -hmm. general clinical features not specific to okay. a patient. some patients may not have visual symptoms some patients mm -hmm. may not have CNS symptoms, may not have mm -hmm. uh, 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 cerebral edema. Some might just have okay. renal failure. You know, it's a, it's a it's a spectrum of clinical presentation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was also. Mm -hmm. Thank Go ahead. you. In terms of uh, discharge, I don't know discharge education or preparation for discharge. I think that you would want to say either advise these people um, how long might it before they are discharged discharge what would advise them to continue uh, upon discharge and uh, and i don't know i don't know if studies have been done to sort of sort of mark up populations where events are, are pre and even in terms of education you can advise it uh, and poisons or to make to certain places because maybe they're prone to think or move under the environment you wouldn't want coming back one in the next uh, and you know, the course of this is known by us. So I think there's an element of education that needs to go on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. I, uh, about 80% of what you said was staccato and we didn't get it very well. I don't know. Did, did you hear it well, Paul? No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of breakage in his uh, connection. I wasn't able to get um, any part of that. Maybe, George, could you kindly uh, maybe give us that again because we didn't get um the, most of it was very staccato we couldn't pick what you were what you were asking george are you there or someone else can ask us george repairs his connection um any other questions but i think he said about uh when if i try and re recollect his try and piece up 
uh, the Sakato uh -huh. question is uh, whether, what is the, uh, what, when do we discharge these patients? I think we dis the patients that will be discharged once the, uh, once the toxidrome is, is cleared. Uh, so, I mean, okay. uh, we'll do a venous blood gas, make sure acidemic, acidemia resolves, uh, make sure mm -hmm. clinical symptoms resolve, dialyze them until their renal, renal function is improving and their kidneys are back, if they will indeed be back. <laughs> Um, some 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 forms, uh, some some uh, damage is ir irreversible, like blindness. So when they're clinically well, I mean, then we'll discharge them. And I mean, post post discharge advice is of course tell them to avoid that, because I think okay. methanol is not some um, methanol is not something that we keep in the house to sip. Like many people have some whiskey yes, yes. The house kids to take. No. Methanol mm. is uh, people will go out to the dens, or may, I know I think very few people will be bringing Changa home. And then kids will have yes. them, bring them in Changa dance. And, and some people might, uh, suicidal people might just go and drink carburetor cleaning fluid then. So I think post discharge instructions just tell them to avoid charm. Yeah? And uh, I, I don't know what I'll tell them. I'll tell them try and avoid that. And uh, I think this will be deliberate self poisoning or recreational. Uh, most of this mm. methanol poisoning is recreational not suicidal okay. actually more setup mm, 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 yeah. okay i don't okay, know if that, that's you. what i tried to make of your question i don't know if i got the gist of it yes yes yes, yes. um i hope that you can hear me clearly yeah, no, I can hear very clear. yes george yes so so i think i was just asking about discharge um protocols in terms of even advice that you'd be giving either these people or the places where like you said these things are not easily accessible so if they are accessible it could be because of, of some illegal channel so yeah. maybe at some point you'd even think of policy are there things that you could do maybe advising the people who make policy to be on the lookout for places where people can access uh, methanol for whatever use whether it's recreation or I, I don't know that someone would deliberately go to commit suicide you know in such places i don't think that that is the case yeah, yeah. so i was asking also about studies like are we able to pick out like have studies been done to sort of establish where these events happen so that even in terms of education then you can go and educate or be on the lookout for because you know these things are harmful so to to advise the people involved in making them or to discourage them, keep them off uh, these things, these agents. Yes, so is there, is there, are there studies? Do we know uh, places that are maybe, uh, I won't call it prevalent, but places where these things are most likely to arise? Yeah, of course, I think uh, from, <clears throat> I think, I mean, these things will be in, in our country, they'll be happening in Chang'a dens. And uh, I mean, the government should come up with policies, right? Um, legalize them so that they can have us, uh, I don't know, space, make sure there's no methanol added into this, into this alcohol or just ban them. I, that's, I mean, that's, I think that is government policy uh, side. About studies from where they are done about incidences, of course, low socioeconomic uh, places, people cannot afford whiskeys and all that they go and take changa so i think maybe we don't need a study for that we know where they happen and uh, just be on the lookout for that i'm not sure how else i can answer your question but uh i think it's known and and like in other places people go for tourists coming here trying and going to test this cha changa stuff and illegal brews i don't know it's all about government policy Government policy, yes, and, uh, just high next of suspicion. We know where it happened. Low socioeconomic places where people want to get high quickly. Teenagers who are going to experiment with these things and uh, sniffing, trying to get solvent in thinners, for example, which people will be doing that. Those will be uh, teenagers or people from low socioeconomic status who want to get high. So, yeah, I think I think we can pick out where they happen, and I think we can target those groups either through education or through more policing of these places it's it's a, a continuum a continuing problem i okay. think yeah okay thank you thank you very much thank you thank okay you. Thank you. Okay, so I can see we have one question in the chat. Uh, it's a question on dialysis. Uh, the question is, if I'm able to do dialysis, do I still need to do the other modalities concurrently? 
Uh, remember I said um, uh, the alcohol, um, the ethanol, the ethanol is a, is a, if you have dialysis, yes, you can, it's a bridging, you know, if you're going to dialyze somebody, you have to put a dialysis catheter, you, uh, uh, you have to do a central line, uh, do a dialysis catheter, and you can just start that as a bridging. And remember I said it's a bridging, a uh, uh, temporizing measure, awaiting hemodialysis. If you can get start, if you can get hemodialysis start, just dialyze them. That's the best. That is the definitive treatment. But as you're waiting, by the time, you know, as you know, by the t some people, we don't have uh, portable dialysis to come to the department. They might have to go to the ICU for the dialysis to be set up, get a line fixed, uh, and then start the dialysis. It might take some time. So temporizing measure uh, for confirmed or suspected methanol poisoning. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Doc. Now, anyone else with uh, a question in regards to methanol, or even just in regards to our topics of discussion today, from the time we started? Uh, any comments, uh, questions? Yeah, you, the floor is open. So, uh, as usual, just uh, unmute, uh, introduce yourself, and then ask your question or give us your comment kindly. Our guys are now, it's been a lot. <laughs> we have it's discussed been a lot. Maybe it's an overdose. Yeah. <laughs> it's a natural overdose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, it's, it's been a, a good discussion. Um, Doc, any 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 comments? I'd like to like uh, Dr. Ronald Sabok, if you're still, if you're still with us, could you just kindly give us um, a uh, We really appreciate having you on board in this uh, talks. We really hope that maybe even in the future ones that we'll be hosting as EMKF, you can be part of our team. That would be actually quite quite cool. And then if you also have something that you want us to discuss, you can, you can actually do that. So maybe if you're, still, if you're still on, maybe you can give us a comment and then I can let Dr. Bharti give us his uh, final yes. for the day. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, nothing much to add. I think uh, Dr. Masiti has sort of exhausted uh, a very good approach and highlighted uh, the common toxicology uh, 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 toxicants that we might uh, uh, commonly find over there in Kenya. Of course, here the, the, the toxicology service is well developed. Uh, what we would need going forward, I think, is maybe considering establishing, let's say, a poisons hotline uh, where we can have someone on call uh, because uh, I think people work in peripheral hospitals, other in rural areas, and they may not have access to maybe the knowledge. And uh, so in cases of this, they should have, let's say, a hotline number where they can just call for advice and be given a way to go. I think that will be a good starting point. And then in future, look at training more people and rolling out uh, more emphasis uh, in toxicology and other emergency medicine cases. So, yeah, it's really good. I'm very encouraged at what's going on and it gives us hope that we can come back and establish this new specialty. Uh, yeah, in future, I'll be very happy to participate even if it's giving talks or uh, leading discussions. I'll be with you and very keen in participating. Thank you very much to you all. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, I think I'll reach out to you through uh, Dr. Mosetti so that we can plan for one, um, uh, maybe for a talk uh, in, uh, in, in an interesting area in emergency medicine. Uh, like I said, we have these talks every last Saturday of the month. So it's something we've been doing for quite a while now. And it's very informative. It's supposed to be quite open um, for people just to discuss and talk about matters emergency medicine. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Doc. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Mosetti? Ah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ron. Uh, thanks for joining us. I know there right now you are going to five o'clock. Um, so we are going to, soon going to finish so that your beer does not get warm. Um, and for the others, I really, I think, uh, as, as Ron has said, we really need, uh, and I think this is something we can explore in EMKF, a poisons hotline and uh, develop this toxicology thing. Because what I've realized here is that there's uh, information we don't have standardized 
uh, approaches uh, and and really people are doing the best they can people are really doing a lot in the periphery peripheries uh, i really uh, shout out to you guys you're doing really well but i think we need a, a hotline where if you get stuck maybe we can um, you can call for help and i think this is something we shall explore with uh, dr washira and Paul Mbuvi and maybe see if we can set up a hotline and 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 um and 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 information or put some information online where you can access it emergency medicine care foundation has a lot of guidelines online you can log in and they are free of charge to have a look at but i think for talks talks is really specific and there are many 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 other things uh, that can be done in talks and i believe toxicology is emergency medicine i think those are the best people suited for managing talks um, and because uh, it's acute management and you come there, we have to do stuff in the emergency department to get good outcomes. So I think in Emergency Medicine Care Foundation, maybe we shall start a talks arm or something or a, or a hotline. In places like in Australia, where I did my training, uh, we had a poisons hotline, which Australia wide is free call. Anybody calls and you either there are people trained who answer the calls, they give you uh, in, uh, they give you advice or they connect you to a toxicologist uh, who's an emergency physician who's done toxicology and, and they'll advise you and guide you. So I think that's where we are going in Kenya. I like the progress we are making in many, many areas of emergency medicine and we shall get there very soon. Um, and uh, uh, thank you once again for attending. There are many issues to discuss. I wanted to discuss kerosene. I wanted to discuss other things, but maybe we shall make another toxicology day to discuss things, this. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice weekend. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Moseti. I appreciate you for the presentation that you've given us. To everyone who took the time to join us in this uh, early Saturday morning presentation, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. As you said, Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation, you can find us online. We have our, our website, which is the emergencymedicinekenya.org. And we are also on all <clears throat> other platforms of social media, including WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Uh, we, we are still looking for actors for us to join TikTok. Uh, once we do, we will let you know. Uh, but for today, I want to thank you guys for joining us. I want to wish you a lovely, lovely weekend. Uh, for those ones who are planning to go to Naivasha, but if you're still willing to go, we'll get there. So, so thank you guys so much. Um, feel free to log out of the meeting. I wish you the best and we'll see you next Saturday for another discussion on open mic. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, thanks.